sharks. It only takes one look to understand who reigns over the underwater world of the ocean. Whether it's the open sea or coral reefs, sharks have found an answer for every challenge. In this underwater realm, they are the undisputed kings. Most humans only dare venture into their world with the protection of technology. But what happens if you can only approach them closely by rejecting this protection? Adventure Ocean Quest. An encounter with a world under the waves. With divers who become underwater beings themselves. They work together with scientists on all the world's oceans. under the surface of the water. Without a sound and without a breath. Adventure in the depths of the sea, the likes of which has never been seen before. The South Pacific, a world of open sea dotted with small islands. This is the starting point for an extraordinary expedition into the world of one of the most bizarre and mysterious shark species, the Great Hammerhead. Their aim is to get closer than ever before to this mighty ocean predator, without the help of any technology. It is a journey into a different world. The hunt for scientific insights takes courage, skill, and self-control, and a deep fascination with nature. In Polynesia, the Great Hammerhead, it's the, the king of the sharks. I think they were right. The old Polynesian have seen this creature for probably uh, three or 4,000 years. There is something about uh, its presence in the water. So uh, yes, for me, it's probably the, the king of the shark as well. Morea an island in the South Pacific that captures the essence of a tropical idol. Green volcanic peaks provide an unrivaled view of the surrounding ocean. French underwater cameraman Christian Petron and two of the best free divers in the world are about to embark on their mission. The Belgian diver Frédéric Bouy holds several free diving world records. And the Canadian world-class free diver William Winram will work closely with Fred as his safety diver. Every island in French Polynesia offers a unique world, but they all have one thing in common. Turquoise bays conceal colorful coral reefs, and the sea forms a major part of life for local people. Morea is the base of the French Oceanographic Institute Criob, where the shark specialist Johan Mouria conducts his research. Hi, Fred. Hi, Welcome Johan. to Criob. Ah, thanks. We go? We go. Johan Muria specializes on lemon sharks and uses some interesting techniques that can also be used to study other types of shark. You also have planned to work with other species uh, somewhere else. Uh, what's the next uh, step for you? We will go to Rangira and uh, try to tag some uh, hammerhead. Mm -hmm. And this is a species that is a uh, uh, usually found in Rangira, but it's very difficult worldwide to, uh, to find this shark. And, and nobody knows what they do during the year when they're not in Rangira, they might be traveling or maybe spending time in open water like oceanic white tips or something? Yeah, you, we, uh, we only know that uh, we can see some individuals uh, coming to, uh, to Rangira, and, uh, but we don't know where they are going. So, there is two kind of techniques we can use there because we don't know what they do. We can put some acoustic tags to and uh, with a receiver uh, for the resilient sharks for the, the, to see if they, yeah. if it's resilient shark. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, we can also put some satellite tags, 
and uh, if they migrate, we will be able to know where they are going. This shark, uh, the great amaret, is uh, quite a shy species, so that's why you, uh, we need your help to uh, to tag it because you don't do bubbles, and uh, you will be able to go closer uh, to the shark, and it will be easier for us to tag it. Uh, I'm, I'm quite happy to be here again and uh, and try to to do that. Rangiroa lies 250 kilometers to the northeast of Tahiti. And with its 80 kilometers length and up to 32 kilometers wide, it is one of the four biggest atolls on Earth. Its name translates as Endless Sky, a reflection of its big skies and open spaces. About 2,000 people live on the biggest of this coral island chain, which is dissected by hundreds of small channels. This is where the ebb and flow of the tides supplies a multitude of food and most of the underwater life congregates. This will be the diver's starting point. Uh, we will uh, attract uh, some uh, big sharks with uh, a bait and we will see what happens, but we hope to, uh, to see maybe hammerheads and uh, maybe uh, tigers. So we never know what to attract, but we hope to, uh, to see big sharks. The weather isn't on the side of the divers. Wind creates waves and difficult currents. Clouds darken the otherwise bright underwater world. But still, the sheer diversity of the underwater world at Rangiroa is impressive. A massive shoal of humpback red snappers is having a rest after the exertions of their nighttime hunting. They are predators, but during the day, they congregate in large shoals to seek protection from bigger hunters. The reef is teeming with wildlife. But there is no sign of great hammerhead sharks. In the wide expanse of the South Pacific, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Again and again, the free divers go down to look for them. They have to remain vigilant. Other sharks are ready and waiting. Gray reef sharks. They often congregate in the channels between the islands. Gray reef sharks are generally curious, but not aggressive towards people. And in contrast to many types of shark, they are still relatively common. They make a nice photo opportunity for Will. Growing to a length of about 2.5 meters, they can dive to an impressive depth of around 300 meters in pursuit of prey. For the team, they're a good sign. These sharks are not just hunters. They're also prey, and their predators include the great hammerhead. Perhaps their presence means that the team have a good chance of finding their shy targets after all. This shark has already been a target of humans and has lost his dorsal fin. Although Fred and Will are surrounded by sharks, they remain calm. Their controlled movements and noiseless presence means the sharks are relaxed and allow them to stay nearby. But bad weather means it's too dangerous to stay in the water. The storm is brewing, and the expedition abruptly has to abandon their search. Today, not a lot of light. Very rainy, but you see it's really messy. That's the lagoon of Hongiroa, and uh, you see the lagoon is uh, like a rough sea, which is not common, and uh, it's bad weather. The boats have to be secured. Although this is the rainy season, the constant bad weather is very unusual. 
one low pressure system follows the next. Bad underwater visibility makes the search for the hammerheads even more difficult. And the rough waves would make it impossible for the divers to return to the boat. But there is a glimmer of hope. The weather forecast for the next few days sounds reassuring. Perhaps they're in luck. The weather clears up. The team is up early to get ready for their outing. Carefully, they load the expensive camera and scientific equipment. Their destination is the outer wall of the reef, where a channel opens from the islands into the open sea. It's the beginning of a long day. The marine biologists usually have to contend with a serious disadvantage during their efforts to observe the animals underwater. Their diving equipment is noisy and can be heard from far away. It is disruptive and frightening for the animals. Free divers, on the other hand, glide noiselessly through the water. Years of training allow them to stay even at greater depths for minutes at a time. It makes them perfect underwater naturalists. Without any technical aids, they search for the shy hammerheads and manage to get close to them. They're not perceived as a threat. And here he is, the king of the Polynesian sharks. It emerges as if from nowhere and quickly disappears again. But at least the divers now know that this is a good spot to place their receivers. These will serve to register signals emitted by the transmitters that they hope to attach to the sharks. They install a concrete base at a depth of 25 meters to anchor the receiver. An eagle ray approaches. They are one of the main prey species for the hammerheads. Perhaps this too is a good sign. Fred also finds a hawksbill turtle nearby. They are now critically endangered and a very rare find. Marine turtles are still hunted for their meat and shells and threatened with extinction. They are usually very shy, but this one doesn't seem to feel threatened by Fred's presence. It's busily looking for food, mainly sponges that live amongst the corals. While the scientists install the receivers at different locations around the reef, Fred continues his search for the hammerheads. But since his brief encounter, he's not seen any sign of the predators. But there are other types of shark everywhere. The divers have to stay alert at all times. The receiver is installed very carefully. Hopefully, it'll record valuable data for the next four years. Silvertip sharks emerge from the depths of the ocean. It's certainly a lot easier to observe these sharks, since they are very curious and approach the divers. They want to find out if it might be worth launching an attack. 
they invest a lot of time to weigh up the situation. Fred and Will don't take the situation lightly and stay very alert. They make sure never to turn their backs to the predators. As long as they can maintain eye contact and don't give the sharks the chance to launch a surprise attack, they're safe. The sharks will not take the risks of attacking an unknown adversary without the element of surprise. While the gray reef sharks always stay near the coral atoll, these bigger silver tip sharks often venture further into the open sea. The outer reef area is their preferred habitat. They're not known to be aggressive towards humans, but down here, nothing can be taken for granted. The sharks do keep a very wary eye on Fred and Will. Then, the divers receive other visitors. Mammals, just like themselves. Curious and playful in the weightlessness of the ocean, they come to investigate the divers. Dolphins are essentially perfectly adapted free divers. They can hold their breath for up to 15 minutes and reach incredible depths of up to 300 meters. The dolphins of Rangiroa have been used to people for a very long time. They are inquisitive and keep only a very small safety distance to the divers. Humans have always been fascinated with the dolphin's playful group behavior and curious nature. And while many shark species also prey on their own kind, dolphins are very sociable animals. These highly developed and successful predators don't spend all day in pursuit of prey. Dolphins have time to play and to enjoy life. For many people, they represent an ideal lifestyle, free and full of a love for life. They decide how long they want to spend with people. Then, they vanish again in the wide expanses of their underwater home. It's been a gripping dive, but the mission to meet great hammerhead sharks face to face was disappointing. At present, there is a lot of um, eager ray in the past that is one of the favorite prey of the great hammerhead. And maybe the sharks were not pretty excited because they already have eaten uh, many prey and are not hungry uh, yet at the moment. So we'll see to, uh, to try again and maybe get back an uh, attack shark. Yeah, all the boats find tiger sharks and hammerheads and we find silver tips, which for me is my first time with the silver tips. And they're cool, I like them. But they are 
that one was just like a Galapagos. Hey, Coming behind and you turn around and he's like, yeah, it's there so specific not cuisine. Yeah. Yeah. It was not there. <laughs> so, still, there's a lot of life here. Oh, yeah. It's huge amounts of fish. Huge, yes. huge, huge. So, that was a nice, nice experience. No, no, it's good to be in the water. It's just sad. Uh, they don't yeah. find what we need. Yeah. Time for a well earned rest while waiting for better weather conditions. The South Pacific continues to present itself from a side that isn't exactly the way it's portrayed in travel catalogues. The divers use their free time to look at a receiver that Johan has recovered from the seabed. So now we have uh, this uh, two sharks data. Uh, there is an interesting pattern. So that would be really interesting to uh, to tag more sharks to, uh, to see what happened mm -hmm. and to see if they all have this behavior because we, at this point, we, we had only two, two sharks. sharks. So they seem to stay in this area in fe until February and to tag with acoustic, both with acoustic and satellite tags, we, we could uh, gain uh, more information about yeah. their behavior. Ideally, two tags on each so, shark would be good. Yeah, this is a satellite tag. So on this tag, we have a different sensor that will uh, store information about um, the temperature, the depth of the shark, and uh, also the light. And with the light, you can, uh, with algorithms... Determine you, the position yeah, of the shark. Yeah, determine the position of the shark. And so we can, uh, usually we put this for a couple, for different months, like usually it's better to uh, to put like uh, five or six months of data. Mm -hmm. And after you, you get this wall information when the tag is <coughs> detached. Mm -hmm. The hammerhead is a big pelagic shark that navigates a lot. And when you find him, or I would say more when he finds you, uh, you have like 30 seconds to, to react because uh, it's a very shy animal and uh, it's just doing one or two turns, check you out, and then he leaves and disappears in the blue. And uh, sometimes you wait for two and a half hours to have uh, 20 or 30 seconds of possible uh, encounter. So within these 30 seconds, you have to do your dive, approach him without scaring him, and find the right spot for the, the tag, so it's not easy. And here we, we struggle a lot. We did a lot of dive, a lot of days in the water, in the same place, waiting, waiting for him. And uh, so we are really curious to see uh, where that shark went because they are very strong swimmers, so they might do thousands of kilometers. We have no idea. So it would be really cool to have the, the, the data from the, the tag and see where uh, the animal went. But Johan has to return to his base on Morea on the next available flight. The search for the great hammerhead sharks has to be put on hold because his ongoing lemon shark research cannot wait any longer. Fred and Will will join him again on Morea. But first, they plan a visit to a very special place on Rangiroa, the Blue Lagoon. It is a protected area, and plans to build hotels and tourist resorts were thankfully never put into action. The palm trees on the beaches are home to a rich variety of bird species, It includes a number of terns like blue and black knotties. Even the violet lorikeet, which has vanished from the majority of South Pacific Islands, still survives here. The Blue Lagoon is also a nursery for black-tipped sharks. In this sheltered bay, they have little to fear and grow up in relative safety.
Although some adults have been measured at two meters, black tip sharks generally only grow to about one and a half meters and weigh about 18 kilos. There are only a few places left on Earth where animals are left in peace from tourists and protected from hunters. The Blue Lagoon of Rangiroa is one of them. Fred and Will return to Morea to join Johan in his work with lemon sharks. Just like the Blue Lagoon of Rangiroa, there are special places on Morea where young lemon sharks grow up in peace. Yeah. Yeah, it's blessing, really. Great. Okay. okay, let's go. Let's go. Yuan puts out nets to examine the young sharks in more detail. How long will they stay in here before they're big enough to go out to the outside of the reef? Do you think? Um, we. We don't really know, but I'm sure they still uh, stay in for maybe uh, one year. Yeah. I have a sample, uh, an individual uh, two year, for two years in the, on the same site. Ah, okay. So resample mm. the same individual. But I think uh, when they are growing, they, they are expanding their home range. And uh, the home range is growing and they will, uh, they will go further and further in the lagoon. But they still come here to protect? I but think they, they still okay, come in, right. in this area okay. to hunt or okay. things like this. And after the first uh, lemon sharks we saw uh, outside the reef is uh, about uh, two meters. So I think they, they are using the lagoon to grow uh, until uh, two meters and after they can they start out. to come back to uh, go on the outside of the reef. Outside of the, reef. the researchers capture some of the young animals to study their development in detail. The shark's yellow or olive coloration now becomes obvious. It is a kind of camouflage against the reefs and sandy sea bottom of their home range. So here we have a female. So I will just need help to carry the shark. We have here, look, we have the umbilical, umbilical scar. So it's a new individual just born like a month ago. Okay. Will? Can you uh, grab it? What? Right. Right. for your hand. Right. We do a gentle example. Okay. Huh? So you want to measure the tail? Yeah, the whole body. Yeah. At birth, these sharks are about 60 centimeters long. But by the time they reach adulthood, they will have grown to around three and a half meters. Adult lemon sharks may look threatening, but lethal attacks on humans are unheard of. Okay. So it's a uh, 69 uh, centimeter. Now I will take a genetic sample. Taking it from here, from the tail. Big mouth. Huh? Yeah. Relative to their big. little body, yeah. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. Me, uh, yeah. Oh, he's okay. Don't worry. Ça veut dire tu peux le refaire. Enfin, c'est en couplet, mais juste. I put the, the sp sample in the alcohol to, for future genetic analysis, so to ext extract uh, DNA. So it can. Uh, just take it for a long time. Okay. Okay. We can, can let, let him go. go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. On y va, mon ami. That's what you want to. It's beautiful. It's yeah. like uh, the 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 big one, but uh, in small. Huh? It's, uh, yeah. Really look like the beautiful real thing. Beautiful little creatures. <laughs> Their eyes are amazing. Adult lemon sharks are only found outside the bays of Morea. The crew gets the necessary equipment ready for their dives the next day.
Free divers don't need much equipment, but their special carbon fiber flippers allow them maximum maneuverability with minimum effort. In order to tag the sharks, the free divers use modified harpoons. Johan will have to use conventional diving equipment, complete with air tanks. Uh, for tagging, I always use a modified spearion. Uh, it's a special shaft it's modified to uh, insert the dart uh, of the tag in the shark. Uh, but otherwise, the spearion is a, is a regular spearion. It's just the shaft that is modified. The team is aiming for the outside of the reef surrounding the island. The scientists want to pass through a channel in the reef and target a spot where they've repeatedly come across lemon sharks in the past. We really have to be careful uh, to tag the shark after he passes you, okay? So uh, like from the, the side, the back side of the shark. So when you tag it, when he will start because he, he feels the shaft and the tag inside him, he will run away. And uh, if you tag it uh, when he's facing you, he might run away and feel trapped and maybe try to bite you. So always have the shark passing you and then tag it so he can just run away uh, in open water. That's very important. Christian Petron will follow the free divers at a distance. They can't afford to have any disturbance to their work. It is simply too difficult and too dangerous. It's much easier to, uh, to tag sharks uh, without uh, bu any bubbles from the, the tanks, uh, diving tanks. and. Um, so that they, can, uh, they can't disturb the sharks and going uh, closer to the sharks and tag in the, in the good way. And so uh, I will show um, Fred uh, which shark to tag and he will uh, try to, to tag it. We try to, um, we try to tag a resident shark. Today it's a resident female we are looking for. And so we hope there, there is a resident female underwater. Lemon sharks are impressive animals. They're among the biggest sharks in the ocean. The diver's work starts with trying to get the animals used to their presence. Lemon sharks have very few natural enemies. The only threat comes from a select few other shark species, or chillingly, their own kind. Other kinds of shark are also inquisitive and approach the divers. They are gray reef sharks and black tip sharks. Lemon sharks tend to hunt all sorts of fish, including smaller sharks and even juveniles of their own kind. But stingrays, crustaceans, octopus and squid are also on their menu. But although the free divers can get close to the animals, the real test is to get the right angle for a successful shot near the back fin. Johan stays at a distance and takes photographs of the animals for his database. Fred is a very experienced fish tagger. His calm patience ensures that the animals aren't nervous. Only a calmly swimming shark can be harpooned with precision. Frightened animals will quickly disappear, or worse, aggressive animals could launch an attack.
since shark skin is unusually tough, the harpoon has to be fired from point-blank range to penetrate it. It is quite a tall order. Again and again, the free divers select a target, but decide not to shoot at the last minute to avoid accidentally injuring the animals. Johan checks the receiver. Four years underwater is a long time. Fred finally decides to shoot. The transmitter is well placed. Johan documents the tag. Fred has reloaded the harpoon and is ready for another attempt. He's in luck. A big female makes for an ideal target. This transmitter is also secure and well-placed. In the next few years, the researchers will find out where the lemon sharks spend their time around Morea, if they have a preference for certain locations, or if they spend their time spread right around the atoll. Johan passes the next transmitter to Fred. mission is complete. It's been an all-round success. For Fred and Will, this was not a difficult operation. But that will be quite a different matter when it comes to the great hammerheads. Even just tracking these sharks is a serious challenge. They return to base. Once again, the divers have witnessed the distinctive sets of behavior that different types of shark have developed. And each individual shark has its own personality. It doesn't do them justice just to distinguish between more or less aggressive animals. Here, on, during that trip, uh, I, I can say uh, I met the, the grumpy lemon shark because these guys are really grumpy. They're like old men, uh, always a bit frustrated and uh, trying to get a bite, and you never know exactly what uh, they think. But uh, at the end, you see they are just like other sharks and uh, beautiful creatures and fragile that we have to uh, uh, try to, uh, to protect, but they are very grumpy. The team returns to Rangiroa one last time. Divers there have come across some great hammerheads and contacted Johan. They're spotted more often at this atoll than anywhere else, probably because their main prey, the gray reef sharks and rays, is available in large numbers. Johan spends the remains of the day to prepare the satellite tags. Without this revolutionary technology, scientists would have practically no chance to track the movements of underwater creatures. Amongst other details, Johan programs the tags with the positioning data at the beginning of the expedition. He also predetermines the amount of time the tag should remain in place before it is released. But he remains skeptical. So everything is ready, and we will see to get a, a shark to tag. The hope to finally get an insight into the secret lives of the great hammerheads depends on the small satellite transmitter. But it can only serve its purpose if the freedivers actually manage to tag a shark. Everyone is apprehensive. We 
just have to be at the right place at the right time. I think it would be difficult uh, for them to tank it, but hope they will have the, the chance to do it. We do our best. The job isn't any easier for the cameraman. They're not allowed to interrupt the work of the researchers. Yet, they're out to get the most sensational pictures of these rare animals. It is almost an impossible task. And to have any chance at all of succeeding in their mission, the free divers need help. The shy great hammerhead sharks have an exceptionally well-developed sense of smell. So Johan has resorted to using a bait fish, a dead reef shark. Its scent will be carried on the ocean currents over many kilometers. The divers try to remain as inconspicuous as possible and wait. Then, in the distance, they spot the contours of a great hammerhead shark. Fred remains motionless to see if the animal is going to come any closer. But the scent has also attracted a tiger shark, one of the most dangerous sharks for a human being in the water. And this one is not at all shy. Some of the biggest sharks in the world now gather in the immediate vicinity of the freedivers. Great hammerheads tend to stay close to shore along the tropical and subtropical coastlines of the world. A fully grown hammerhead can reach between three and six meters and weighs up to 500 kilos. They're amongst the most impressive creatures in the ocean. But science still has no concrete answer to the question of why these sharks have such a bizarre head shape. The researchers want to find out what advantages the hammerhead sharks get from this strange adaptation. Some scientists think it provides aerodynamic advantages. The shape could provide greater stability during lightning fast maneuvers in the water. Hammerheads have also been observed using their heads to pin rays to the ground before eating them. The extreme width of their heads could make it easier to receive the electromagnetic signals of their prey. Or perhaps the hammerheads are able to build up three-dimensional impressions of their surroundings through their sense of smell. But all of these theories have yet to be confirmed. Gradually, the hammerhead shark approaches the bait. But the tiger shark is also still nearby. Slowly, the circles of the hammerhead around the bait are getting tighter, bringing the shark closer to the divers. The free divers finally have the chance to take some photographs for Johann's catalog.
Now they're ready for action. Fred collects the tagging harpoon. A second hammerhead shows up. It's a great sign. Perhaps the divers will finally be in luck. The animals seem to be gaining in confidence around the divers. But to be successful in their tagging mission, everything has to be just right. This will be far more difficult than tagging the lemon sharks. The best time to approach is when the shark is busy tucking into the bait. Fred approaches directly above the shark. But the tip of the harpoon bounces off the tough skin of the shark. tries a different strategy. He stays on the seabed until he spots a chance to shoot. He lies in wait like a hunter. And the chance arrives. The shark passes him at close range but still, Will decides against a shot. He could easily injure the animal from this angle. They have to get the timing exactly right, and they need a double dose of luck. Eventually, success. The transmitter is secure. A hard day's work for the free divers. The hammerhead is very tough skin. The first uh, shot, Fred was, for any other shark, perfect mm. perfect position, close enough, but it uh, bounced off. So, and the rush was on to retrieve the tag, reload the gun, replace the tag, and then wait for the animal to return. But uh, the second shot was perfect. It's very difficult anymore Oof. Yeah. to work with. They don't come from the direction you expect. But the thing is, it's not arriving upstream like other sharks. It's always the first time, every time he was on the site, he comes downstream. Yeah, yeah, they don't, they don't come from the direction the current is flowing. They come from yeah, with the current. Every sea creature is coming up, yeah. up current. Yeah. And these things are going down current. Yeah. So maybe they saw us feel it before and do a big turn and come back to get. I think them. they sent it and they go around and they, yeah, they come. Usually they just go to the source. The dive team has completed their work, but this is only the beginning for the scientists. They now have to hope that the transmitter can collect as much data as possible. When it eventually returns from the depths of the ocean, it will cast some light on the secret life of the king of the sharks. Every time you work with a new species, uh, you have to adapt, uh, because the shark won't adapt to you, of course. Uh, so basically, the techniques are the same. Uh, I use the, the sinking technique we use in spear fishing or waiting technique at the bottom. But uh, you always have to trim it uh, because every animal reacts differently. Uh, the great amaret is very fast, won't stay uh, long on site, turning around. It just satisfies its curiosity and then leaves. Other sharks will stay there for half an hour and uh, you have a lot of time to figure out how you're going to work with it. So uh, you have to be very, very adaptive. And uh, I noticed that within the hammerheads, they also have different personalities. One was more, um, uh, I would say, uh, 
curious about us and stayed a bit longer and came back and came back every five, six minutes he was coming back. Uh, but another one just came 30 seconds and left. We haven't seen him. So uh, you really have to be prepared and uh, adaptive. Uh, that's also the fun part of, the, of that job. Uh, but it's probably the most difficult shark I had to work with and probably one of the most difficult thing I ever did freediving, to tag that hammerhead. Even though it was in 15 or 16 meters of water, not a long dive, but just uh, the dedication, the timing, the mindset, and all that, uh, putting everything together. He had a lot of current that day, uh, and also being able to have uh, a camera not too far. It was very difficult to put everything together for, uh, for success. So it, yeah, it was probably one of the most difficult thing I did freediving. The humpback whale, a true heavyweight of the sea. A colossal creature at up to 19 meters long and weighing up to 36 tons. But although its sheer size commands respect, its placid, peaceful nature and downright elegance are remarkable. Only a lucky few have ever come face to face with this gentle giant. It's a once in a lifetime experience. The island of Rurutu in the South Pacific. An exceptional team of divers with a set of specialist skills is about to embark on a journey in the tracks of humpback whales. Their aim, to study the whales in an unusually intimate way. I think freediving is a very good way to explore the underwater world. And it's probably the, the less invasive way of exploring the underwater world. In spite of their massive size, whales are extremely shy animals and difficult to approach. Most people are only ever tolerated for a few seconds. There's still a lot to learn because we still have an estimation about 15,000 animals, maybe, humpbacks in, in the um, uh, South Hemisphere, but among them, only a few proportion has been identified with pictures. To explore their secret lives beneath the waves, it is essential to meet the whales in their element and on their terms. These whales are enormous. They're not small fish. They weigh 30 tons. That's a bit like an approaching bus. They are really majestic. Rurutu is a tiny island in the middle of the South Pacific. Discovered by James Cook in 1769, it now forms part of French Polynesia. Few visitors ever set foot on this isolated island, so its greatest asset is its unspoiled wilderness. Only seven kilometers long and three kilometers wide, it lies far off the main shipping routes. But it does lie right in the path of another very special route, the migration of the humpback whales. They were once hunted by the native peoples, but today, French Polynesia has been turned into a unique conservation area for marine mammals. Diving with conventional equipment is strictly prohibited here. It makes it an unusually safe and peaceful haven for the humpback whales. And this is where they come during the harsh winter months in their Antarctic feeding grounds. It is an epic annual trip of 7,000 kilometers. Although humpback whales tend to be loners, it is possible to find whole groups of them here. It is an ideal place for a whale nursery. The cows give birth to their calves in these warm tropical waters. Here their young are safe from deep sea predators and protected from violent storms. It 
It is mid-September. The intense tropical colors typical of these South Pacific islands have vanished, and Rurutu is immersed in the threatening gray of a tropical storm. The weather is unusually unpredictable and threatening. It's been raining for days. The idea of spotting whales just off the shoreline remains a distant dream. These are bad conditions for the free divers Frédéric Bouilly and William Winram. Their expedition to find and catalog the whales could be in jeopardy. They're on their way to assist Cécile Gaspard, the founder of the Polynesian conservation organization Te Mana o Te Moana, or Spirit of the Ocean. Hello. 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 Welcome to Polynesia. Ah, How are you? Beautiful weather. How was the trip? Good. Oh. Yeah, it's good weather. Tomorrow is better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The weather forecasts are very vague. The team can only hope for the best. So we go tomorrow morning. Yes. The whales have been seen around, so uh -huh. we have a lot of luck. Good. And Great. so, Good. let's go. Okay. Cool. Ah, okay, go. Okay. Finding the whales in the waters around Rurutu is usually not a problem, but they need better weather to conduct Cecile's study effectively. A lot of studies have been done on whales and other um, marine treasure for the past decade. And it's very interesting to get information. We know, the, for example, the whaling uh, has damaged a lot of this population. And we also know now, we've our study, that population is in a better shape. It starts to reproduce. And we hope this is going uh, on the good side. But we're not sure, because there are so many changes in the world that maybe our hope right now is going to be completely different in a few years. The new kind of research we have been developing with Fred, going in the water with the whale, and be very comfortable as a whale you know, in the water is going to help us having new type of information and also share it with other people. And this is one of the key where if we could study uh, wildlife without too much interference, we may get more information, more accurate information without too much disturbance. And so we hope that this is a new step in, in research and that could be maybe an example worldwide about how human can use its ability to adapt to nature to better study it. Finding a whale requires discipline and patience. Since whales tend to keep their bodies mostly submerged, it means having to spot a whale's back as it's about to dive. Even better is to search for the blow, the cloud of fine spray when the whale exhales on surfacing. Oh, whales just blow behind us. But even once a whale is spotted getting into the water with them, and obtaining useful images is far from easy. The first thing is to locate the whale, since it's always in motion. When it's moving, it's tough to film it. So you have to wait until it finds a resting place. If you're watching a mother with her calf, you can wait until she feeds the baby. Then the whale will remain calm and still, and you can carefully enter the water. Right now, that's not possible. This whale is swimming around the island. It's moving, and we can't film it. The search for whales is tough and time-consuming. Even once a blow has been spotted, there's no guarantee that the whale will continue its travels in the same direction underwater. And actually getting into the water to attempt a closer encounter is only worth it when it's certain there's still a whale in the vicinity. The only option is to keep your eyes peeled and constantly evaluate the situation. But the team will also have to keep an eye on the tourist whale watching boats. The danger uh, when you are involved in ocean activities, it's always human. Uh, it's never the creature or the weather or anything. It's always human. And here, the biggest problem is that we have like four boats around the whales. <coughs> so uh, you have to be very careful not to be run over by one of the boats. And uh, moreover, when day like that with not a lot of sun, uh, all the colors are the same on, uh, on the water and our wetsuit are quite dark. And uh, you have to be very careful. So that's why we have to spot each other with William. Uh, in order not to be run over. But the whale watchers give up. Fred and the team have more patience and continue their search. Finally, 
a humpback whale. The camera team gets ready. They will watch Fred from a distance. Diving is usually strictly prohibited in the area. The loud noise associated with conventional diving equipment agitates the animals. And since they're supposed to be left in peace to mate and raise their new calves, these disturbances are not tolerated. But the free diving team has special permission to observe the whales underwater. Free divers are different. They move silently through the water. Years of training allow them to spend several minutes at a time below the surface. They are perfect underwater observers. They can search for the whales without the help of noisy technology and wait patiently until an opportunity arises to get close to the animals. But the whales are very alert. Despite the free diver's utmost care, they soon put an end to their rest period and move on. The good news for the team is that they don't seem to be nervous. They even take the time to investigate the divers. It bodes well for any future encounters. Fred can clearly observe and document the unique patterns on the whale's delicate underside. Conditions improve. The weather gradually clears up. But for now, the team's luck has run out and they don't spot any more whales. Fred and Will decide to find out more about the indigenous population who used to hunt whales around the island. Perhaps they can shed some light on the best places to find the whales. They visit the caves in which the original inhabitants lived and from where they would look out for passing whales. The steep cliffs provided not only protection but also a good vantage point to scan the sea. Calm and protected bays allowed them to go out to sea even in rough weather. But reaching the caves is anything but easy and involves traversing difficult terrain. The caves themselves are also dangerous. Without a guide, it's easy to get lost in this underground network of chambers and tunnels. The native people had vantage points scattered across the island from where they could observe the whales. Rurutu's hills reach almost 400 meters above the sea level. There are no signposted paths up here. Time for a rest beneath some spectacular stalactites. Even today, there are still people on the island who remember the old whaling days and their ancestors' traditions. Fred has been told about Mama Paré, one of the oldest islanders. She's written a book about the history of Rurutu. Perhaps she can explain the whale's current elusiveness after their initial brief encounter. We've been here for several days already, and we still haven't come close to any whales. Are there years when there aren't any whales here? The whales come every year. American and Japanese whalers killed hundreds of them, so now we see a lot less of them than in the past. Now the fishermen have to go on long journeys. But usually you still see a lot of whales here. 
They amuse themselves. You can watch them from the beach as they jump out of the water. It's a disadvantage for you since you've not been allowed to hunt whales for years, but the Japanese still kill many. We caught one whale in 1930 and then the last one in 1957. That's over 20 years later. You didn't catch any whales for 20 years? No, not a single one. Do you think that they'll come back soon? There are some around. A few people saw one not long ago. They told us it was a mother with her calf. Fred has also been told about another sign of whale season on Urutu, and he decides to follow it up. It's the flowering of the whale tree. A fisherman takes Fred to this special tree. So the tree is in full bloom at the beginning of the whale season. Yes, that's when it's covered in blossoms. When it begins to flower, it means that the whales have arrived. That's when the whaling season starts. That's right. And what happens when the trees finish flowering? That's when the whales have gone. So we may have come at the end of the season. Yes. If this bit of local folklore is correct, the team has come here at the right time. But then there's another setback. Sirens sound an alarm. There's been a fax from Papete, the capital of Polynesia. It's a tsunami warning. Nobody seems to have concrete information. The team desperately tries to find out more. I'm in contact with France. It's possible this is the last chance to be in touch before the tsunami hits. They know that we're taking all necessary precautions to evacuate people. So we stay here until it arrives? I guess. See what it looks like. The island's shoreline is quickly evacuated. Technical equipment is packed and everyone hastily retreats to higher ground. The wait begins. The tsunami hits Samoa and kills 120 people. But it doesn't reach Urutu. The island has a lucky escape. For the expedition, the first few days on the island have been very disappointing. So when a call from Dr. Michael Poole, a humpback whale expert on Moria, reaches a dive team, they're quick to take up the opportunity. Dr. Poole would be interested to meet them. Moria is one of the society islands, 600 kilometers to the northeast of Urutu. Its bigger neighbor is Tahiti. It is located right in the heart of the conservation area for marine mammals that was established in 2002. Lush vegetation and high trees cover the island, and imposing volcanic peaks rise up from the sea. It is the essence of tropical tranquility. The bright turquoise bays with their deep, clear waters are lined with a protective fringe reef that reaches right around the island. Dr. Poole has been based here for the last 15 years. He's the director of the Marine Mammal Research Program at the Island Research Center and Environmental Observatory. He's one of the driving forces behind the setup of the whale and dolphin sanctuary. Every time we find an answer or partial answer to one question, there are five other questions that pop up. And some basic things that we do not know. How do whales navigate? We don't know. How do they find their breeding ground? How do they find their feeding ground? 7,000 kilometers distance between Antarctica and here in Tahiti. And how do they undertake that migration and find, we find some of the same whales coming back different years to the same island. How do they do that? We don't know. Um, the song of the humpback whales, the males that sing the song, what is it really for? We have different hypotheses, but no one is totally sure really what's going on. Why does the song change? During a season and over years, why does the song evolve over time? We don't know this at all. And so we're searching 
every day we're out, every week we're out, every month and over years to tr try to find answers to these questions. Myself, my colleagues, our students, all trying to find answers to these questions. We've never lost that fascination because there's so much that we don't understand. And another reason why you and your ability to dive deeply and stay long is valuable to our research is that you can photograph the underside of the individual or the side of the individual. And with your photographs, we can sex the individual. Free diving has a long tradition in Tahiti. Both fishermen and pearl divers have used the technique for hundreds of years. Local knowledge is always invaluable, and the Tahitian free diver Matana Taimana accompanies Fred on his next dive. On the way, she has a chance to show Fred a very special local attraction, stingrays that show no fear of humans. Christian Petron gets his equipment ready. The stingrays are already waiting right under the boat. Due to the venomous barbs on their tails, they have a reputation as lethal marine creatures, but here, they're at ease and don't pose a significant threat. Elegantly gliding through the water, the rays live up to their docile reputation and don't respond nervously to the divers. But to find humpback whales, the divers have to leave these shallow waters. The tireless search for the whales begins again. Dr. Poole doesn't usually work with divers. He tends to watch and identify the animals from the surface using a catalog of photographs. Humpback whales have completely individual tail fins distinct both in shape and coloration. Occasionally, the whales give spectacular, even acrobatic performances. They emerge from the water and thrash the surface with their tail fins. These may be attempts to rid themselves of irritating parasites. The energetic spectacle means that fragments of whale skin come loose, which the scientists quickly gather from the water. It allows them to analyze the animal's DNA. Over time, they can piece together a more and more detailed description of each individual. Fred prepares for a dive. Should a whale approach, he has to be ready. Christian is only too aware that it will take a bit of luck to get the chance to film Fred near the whales. It can mean hours of waiting, ready to get in the water in minutes. Patience is one of the absolute requirements to make it as a wildlife filmmaker. Then they're in luck. They spot a whale cow with her calf. They seem to be resting near the surface. There's no time to lose. Fred always makes the first explorative dive on his own. 
By the time the other divers manage to reach the required depths, the whale may have already moved on. This time, luck is on their side. The whale calf is not at all shy, even playful, while its mother is having a rest further down. It's a one-off chance for a close encounter. The divers have to be very careful. Even a calf's tail fin could wreak havoc. But this intimate meeting of the whale baby and the free diver is overall too soon. The mother eventually intervenes, and the two majestic marine mammals move on. But then Fred spots another opportunity. A school of pilot whales passes nearby. For a few minutes, Fred can swim alongside them. whales are being followed. An oceanic white-tipped shark is on their tails. This is a formidable predator, reaching around three meters in length. But the whales are safe in its company. Oceanic white-tipped sharks are often found in the company of pilot whales, although the reason for this association is not fully understood. It's a breathtaking experience for Fred. For a few seconds, a few minutes, I'm really part of the environment as one of the habitants of that environment. I try not to bring my human abilities with me, but try really to forget about them, bury them somewhere in my brain, and just being like an animal or part of the area and diving. Free diving allows you to do that. And as Fred becomes one with his environment, the animals he encounters seem to perceive him as one of them. He can witness their behavior in an entirely different way. Tracking whales is laborious and time-consuming, but there are some shortcuts. Sometimes it's possible to hear these giants before you see them. And Fred's luck hasn't run out yet. Photographs like these can only be taken underwater. They're a very welcome addition to the whale researcher's catalog. So maybe we can talk about the, this mark? No? That's really pretty, Fred. I mean, from an aesthetic viewpoint, it's absolutely yeah. beautiful. Nice marks, yes. And look how these throat plates bifurcate. Can you go backwards just a second? Right here, splitting into two. Indeed, allowing more spread, more expansion as it takes in water and food. Very, very nice. These detailed photographs of the whale's unique markings are invaluable to Dr. Poole's research. Working from the boat, he would normally be unable to take any pictures as detailed as these.
we can actually identify whales, not only by their tails, not only by their dorsal fins, we can identify them by their pleats. They are different for every individual. Great photograph, Fred. Yeah, truly, really nice. But, but Fred soon has to return to Rurutu to continue his original mission. It isn't looking positive. Will has told him that the team still haven't managed to sight any whales. This is highly unusual for this time of year. Normally, there are always several whale groups in the area. Could there be a connection with the disturbance of the storms or the tsunami? Not a blow anywhere to be seen. A frustrating wait for the divers. Nothing yet. In the past, they had sometimes a period of one week to 10 days with no animals because they go to other islands. Okay. So uh, hopefully it's the case and they yeah. just left for one week or so, but still it's uh, apparently like eight days now they haven't yeah. seen a whale. Uh, we have to keep our fingers crossed and hope for the best. Fred tries to stay optimistic. He knows only too well the value of his abilities to a mission like Cecile's. The best example of the, the difference between scuba diving and free diving uh, is that, for example, in many places, it's forbidden to scuba dive with the animals, like whales, dolphins, sharks, or even reefs. And uh, the scientists understood that it's disturbing a lot. Most of the time, free diving is allowed. Uh, for example, here in Rorotu, you cannot uh, scuba dive with the whales, but you can free dive. With free diving, you don't disturb them as much. But of course, with free diving, you can also disturb whales. Right? It doesn't mean you just uh, part of the water and they don't notice you. But uh, the general disturbance is smaller with free diving. But you still have to be careful when you approach them, uh, to approach them from front, not from behind, otherwise they feel you and they go away and try always to be in their field of vision. Uh, it's not because you're a free diver that you can uh, go everywhere and do whatever you want. You still have to keep an ethic to your work and the way you, you work with animals. It's not, uh, uh, I would say, a general visa, being a free diver. You still have to, to be careful. The team continues their efforts. Again, the boat is loaded with equipment and supplies. They're committed to their mission. But for Cecile, too, time is running out. She's expected back on Morea. So Christian wants to try a different tactic to track down the whales. He has a special hydrophone, a microphone for underwater recordings. Encased in a watertight housing, this highly sensitive microphone registers sound waves underwater and records them. Christian's plan is to listen for signs of the whales just like on Morea. And if you can hear a whale, you can also find it. Today, conditions at least are very favorable. The visibility is good and the sea relatively calm. Fred and Will get into position in the water. Christian lets the hydrophone drift around 10 meters below the surface. And the tactic seems to be working they pick up some interesting sounds. And these are special. They clearly originate from a whale. The problem is to work out the direction from which the sounds are coming. Finally, success. They've come across a singer. Whales take up a particular position in the water when they're about to sing. 
they remain motionless in the water column, head down and fins outstretched. Underwater, it's actually possible to feel the powerful sound waves. The exact method of generating the sounds is unclear. Unlike land animals, the whales don't exhale while producing them. It's possible they manage to recycle air within their bodies to continue their songs without having to breathe. For the divers, this encounter with a singing humpback whale was a first real success in their mission near Rurutu. They return to dry land and prepare to brief Cecile in the evening with precious underwater images as well as observations of the behavior witnessed. Male humpback whales sing during the mating season. It's possible they're trying to attract a mate with their serenades. But their songs could also serve to keep potential rivals at bay. Studies have shown that different whale populations have their own distinct songs. The tunes the males produce are complicated and travel for hundreds of kilometers underwater. The different sounds combine to produce individual verses, which are repeated in a particular order and are constantly developed further. Cecile explains to Fred why she is so interested in more information about the whales. What is your hope for the future? So I think even if we fear there has been very good action in the past, we still need to go and do more and we need to go very fast. So I think whales are very appealing to people and if really there is a message that whales are uh, still threatened by all the human activity, even if it's not hunting, but now it's pollution and global warming, then we hope that these people may be more sensitive to react. We also found that when people had um, close contact with a wild animal, they feel they know this animal better, they feel it different way, and when they come back home, they are like, okay, now maybe I'm going to recycle my trash. So we try. The divers are eager to continue their work the next day, but they don't get very far. The engine breaks down. Without engine power, the boat drifts helplessly and threatens to run aground on the reef. They have to abandon their whale search before it even started. The priority now is to call a rescue boat. Can you use that, please? Attention à déborder, préparez-vous à déborder. They've been lucky to escape with no further damage, but it's a further disappointment. For today, they're unable to start another excursion. Fred and Will try to spend their time usefully and visit the next village to stock up on supplies. Around lunchtime, after school, the place comes alive with young people. The 
people are very friendly here. Road 2, you see it's a very small island, so everybody knows each other. When you walk in the street, uh, people say hi. Uh, everybody is really friendly. You can go everywhere. They give you fruit from the garden. You can ask them to pick up fruit from the garden if you need. Uh, people are so friendly. Other than exuberant wilderness, Rurutu doesn't have much to offer its visitors. The villages are not packed with tourist attractions, but customs have to be kept alive in traditional crafts, which are one of the main forms of income for the islanders. But there are one or two surprises in store for the divers. Rurutu also has French roots after all. The divers need to have a high calorie intake, and they found just the place to get them. I did not expect to find this on this small really? remote island. No. Mm. You know, it's French Polynesia. They have some traditions. Oh, oh. Mm -hmm. Wow. While their boat is being repaired, they can only wait and watch while others demonstrate their diving prowess. A new day brings fresh hope, but although the sun's out, diving conditions are bad. The divers want to reach the open sea through a pass in the island's fringe reef. There are only a handful of these gates in the reef. Things aren't going to plan. With the condition today, there's no way the boat can pick you up on the no. other side. No, no, no. It's too rough. It's way too rough. For us, conventional divers, big waves aren't a problem. We can dive under them. But for the free divers, it's impossible because they get overrun by the waves and can't prepare their dives. Even the stunning South Pacific beaches are no consolation. The divers are again forced to wait until wind and waves calm down. Eventually, they're able to try their luck once again. This time, the start is more promising. Now they have to follow the whales. A last equipment check. They've managed to find a whale cow with her calf. They're an ideal target for the divers, since the pair will definitely have a rest period at some point. The divers continuously check that they haven't lost the whales. They don't want to take any chances and miss their long-awaited chance of a close encounter with the whales of Rurutu. Finally, things seem to be going their way. They can risk approaching the animals face to face underwater. The whale mother remains motionless in the depths, resting, floating upright in the water column, her eyes lifted towards the surface. She keeps an eye on her baby.
The calf is very curious, playful and exuberant. Although still a baby, it is already an enormous animal and dwarfs Fred. It seems curious about this silent intruder into its underwater world and shows no signs of nervousness. On this occasion, Fred has enough time to watch the animal closely and catalog its distinctive marks in detail. It's a unique and rare opportunity to meet these mysterious creatures on their own terms and in their own element before finally it's time for the mother and calf to move on. This mission turned out to be no easy task for Fred and the team, but despite all the setbacks, they've been successful in delivering some important underwater images of the Rurutu whales. They will provide valuable information and identification clues for the researchers. These are the, the picture I took the other day of the mother and calf. The calf was very playful. He, it was we had to be be careful because it was really like a little kid, yeah. little pup. He didn't know where to put his fin, so we had to be careful. So you have a very good access to the belly. Yes. You know, and yes. so this is a very distinctive mark that will grow with the animal, mm -hmm. of course. Um, did you get an estimation of the size? Uh, the size, I think it was around six meter long. Okay. It's, it was young, but uh, from this year for sure, yeah, but yeah. Uh, maybe one, one and a half months okay. old okay. already. Yeah, yeah. It was true. just not a newborn. Huh? Okay. So, you know, Fred, this is very important because this kind of, of marks on the skin that are so distinctive and so impressive, they are going to stay all the life. Mm -hmm. So this animal, if it's seen in one month, two months, 10 years, 20 years, maybe 40 years, you can tell this is the that same animal I was spotted there. by you in Rutu this yeah. year. So that's very interesting. Maybe during my next trip to Antarctica, I might yeah. bump into that whale again. Exactly, so this is how it's very important for not only researchers, but tourists and any people that have access to whales and, and, and take pictures to be able to download the pictures to this very extensive catalog. And then if you have specific correct mark like that, uh, or natural mark like that, they should be uh, labeled mm -hmm. so people could find them again. Yes, I'm always happy when uh, one of my pictures can be used for something else that just being a picture. Uh, if it can help and improve the, the knowledge about these animals, it's it's great. It's uh, great. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a great picture, you know, but it will be also used but by... But I was really fascinating by the, the pattern of the, that oh, birthmark. It's just, uh, I've never seen that before. Part of the fascination people seem to have developed for the whales here must surely also lie with their exotic summer territories, the South Pacific. What we find here in islands like Rorotu, it's, uh, it's the Pacific Islands 150 years ago. For me, the impact whales are the most fascinating whales because every year they do thousands and thousands of kilometers to go from their feeding ground in Antarctica back here in the South Pacific Island to rest and mate and have the babies and then go all the way back with the newborn babies in the feeding ground of Antarctica. And that's a mystery because they do this very, very dangerous journey twice a year. It's fascinating to watch them, how they move in the water. Um, it's also, it's awe-inspiring to, to feel so small. When you're next to uh, an enormous whale, you feel tiny. And sometimes when uh, 
I'm free diving with a whale here in Rorotu. Uh, when they sleep, they lay at 25 meters, I look at, at the whale and I say, yeah, that's a wonderful life. It's the whale therapy. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah, yeah. It's true. I mean, all your problem disappears when you see a creature like that because it's so big, it's there for like thousands and thousands of years. It's, it's just a perfect creature. And, uh, and peaceful, and uh, after spending time with them, yeah, you, you change, for sure, you change. By themselves, they, they can change you from inside. They can really do that. The Mediterranean, a forgotten Eden. It has shared its riches with people for thousands of years. Home to mysterious places and scenes of past tragedies. A world that still harbors astonishing untold secrets in its blue depths. Freediver Frédéric Bouilly is on an extraordinary quest. For thousands of years, the Mediterranean had been abused and turned into a veritable cesspool by the people living along its shores. Now he wants to take stock. What condition will he find the Mediterranean in? And how have people changed this underwater world? His extraordinary freediving abilities, sensitivity, and not least his courage, allow Frédéric to become part of his underwater surroundings. He manages to uncover spectacular secrets that remain hidden to most. Only a diver that behaves like a fish is able to really get close to them. His noiseless and extremely flexible diving technique allows him to investigate places that remain out of reach for conventional divers. he can experience this world in a new way. He's searching for traces of the underwater paradise that the Mediterranean used to be. 50 kilometers off the French coastline near Marseille lies the Galabon, ready to begin a three-week expedition of the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean has a surface area of around two and a half million square kilometers, and is among the most ravaged sea regions in the world. On board, an unusual team, anxious to begin their mission. It includes a renowned underwater cinematographer and two of the best free divers in the world. Christian Petron has a wealth of experience, including Luc Besson's cult movie, The Big Blue. The Belgian Frédéric Bouy, former world record holder that has now devoted himself to underwater photography. His security diver is the record-breaking freediver, William Winram. So I heard from a lot of people that uh, there's not much life in the Med. And, you know, I mean, I've only dove uh, around Nice and uh, a few other places and not seen a lot of fish. So don't know what to expect. You'll be surprised. With Christian, we're going to show you some of the nicest place, and it will change your idea about the Mediterranean Sea forever. Really? Yeah. I look forward to it. Finally, the expedition gets underway. They're heading east to the island of Porquerolle and the wreck of the Donateur, the remains of a freighter that hit a mine after the end of World War II and sank. Wrecks have always been favorite dive spots, not least because of the sense of mystery and danger that surrounds them. For me, that kind of dive is the essence of freediving, it's what I like to do in freediving, because going to 50, 50 meter zone uh, with current, no visibility, no line to guide you, and just use your senses to, to get, somehow it's a sixth sense to find the wreck, because you don't know exactly where it is. You, you feel maybe the, the big metallic uh, mass at the bottom of the sea to guide you. Um, I think that's the essence of freediving. Okay, this, this morning we uh, look for diving on the Donato. Uh, is a wreck uh, sinking during the, just uh, 
after the World War II. Mm -hmm. Very, very nice work. Uh, we have to do a, a good diving plan. Uh, William and I will be able to do four dives, not more. No. Also, on the wreck, when we arrive first, uh, there is a lot of chance to see a big school of fish uh, with Dentex, uh, Bream and Sar. So we have to be very uh, silent when we arrive on top of the wreck, uh, not to scare them away. If they are there, it's very spectacular. You will see a lot of fish. Uh, the problem is in the middle of the channel between these two islands, which means you have a lot of current there. That's why it's a rich wreck, but also it makes a very difficult dive. Okay, let's go. Let's go. From their base on the Gare Le Bon, the team approaches the Donateur's wreck site with a more versatile Zodiac. The weather looks promising, but it gives little indication of the conditions below the water surface. Currents, visibility and water temperature are all unknown. For dives like this one in considerable depths, everything has to be just right, no matter how experienced the divers might be. dead ship are overrun with life. It seems nature has conquered the barren bleakness of human technology and turned it into a true paradise. The colors revealed by the spotlights are incredible. And although the color red is swallowed up in the blue depths, it is there, spectacularly exposed by the artificial light. This dive is a serious challenge for the free divers. Just to get here and back, they have to cover over 100 meters on a single breath. Once at the wreck, they have to be careful to conserve energy to avoid a potential blackout on the way back. Reefs are like underwater islands in the blue expanse of the ocean. They offer shelter and food for all kinds of underwater creatures. And while the wreck of the Donateur is an artificial island, it has been here for over 60 years, allowing masses of organisms to colonizing it, turning it into a true underwater city. The wreck attracts divers in droves. On resurfacing, Fred and Will have to be extremely careful not to be hit by the numerous boats. A collision with the ship's propeller could be fatal.
Underwater, peace and quiet prevails. Until the scuba divers arrive, everything changes dramatically. The exhaled bubbles from all these divers now dominate the wreck. Mud is whirled up from the seabed. The fish retreat. Nothing left to see here. It's really interesting when we arrived, our first two dives at 20 meters, you could see the wreck clearly. Now, with all the movement on it and all the sediment being stirred up, at 20, it's barely visible. show down there. Of already 110 divers. With that boat arriving will be more than 150 in the same dive spot. It's just crazy. It's time for the divers to have a rest. For Christian Petron, this expedition is part of a personal mission. 25 years ago, he already documented the catastrophic pollution of the French Mediterranean to raise awareness of its enormous scale. These are the pictures we filmed 25 years ago in front of Marseille. There was absolutely no treatment of the raw sewage, nothing. No, nothing was treated. This was practically the toilet for 300,000 people. It all went directly into the sea. It was a real cesspool. We went diving here to show the damage to the coastal waters. Everything was dead here. The fish, all dead. It was a disaster. Shocking pictures like these were part of the trigger for one of the most progressive environmental projects in the Mediterranean. A massive artificial reef in the Bay of Marseille. Sandrine Druiton from the Université de la Méditerranée is the scientific leader of the project. She takes Fred out to the reef. This project could be compared to the reforestation of a desert. This is the map of the artificial reefs. That's interesting because we've built several ecosystems next to each other which benefit from each other, as you can see. The inside of the artificial reef is made up of concrete boxes. They allow a complex structure and provide a variety of living spaces for different species. The buoy is there for the diver's orientation. From the surface, it's impossible to make out this new built estate for underwater creatures. It lies at a depth of around 20 or 30 meters. Hobby divers and fishermen are banned from this area. Disturbances are to be kept to a minimum. But the free diver's sensitive and unobtrusive technique is ideal. Fred approaches the artificial reef cautiously. He's concerned not to scare any of its residents away. 
but visibility is very poor and Fred has to move closer. He is completely noiseless. It's his only chance to catch a glimpse of the shy fish. I dived from below and approached the reef from below. Above it, I saw a few sea bream there. Oh, that's interesting. That's an important fish. Um, and uh, you've surely seen a lot of little fish as well. Yep, yeah, that's right. But I didn't disturb them. Sandrine takes pictures of the organisms that have begun to settle here. Algae and invertebrates are the first to take up residence and form the basis of a new food chain. Yeah, interesting. Uh, it's a big structure and a uh, lot of fish just swimming on top of it. And uh, the fish uh, noticed my presence, but they were not too afraid. And then when I started to be really on the reef, they went slowly in open water. Uh, but it's interesting to see it, it works. The, that structure really works to aggregate fish. It's very interesting. The developments are documented meticulously. A mass of factors influence the success or failure of the project. Currents, depth, and the structure of the build are all instrumental. But the divers don't just find signs of the gradual settlement of the new reef. Sandrine also finds a fishing net that has got caught in the structure. It is a definite sign that fishermen are ignoring the no-go zone. Artificial reefs are only part of the efforts to bring life back to the coastal waters of the Mediterranean. The most important step was to build sewage treatment works to restore the water quality sufficiently to support life. Sandrine shows Fred the progress made in the structure's settlement. Some fish are beginning to return. They, in turn, will provide food for bigger fish in the future. And the project's success will be directly beneficial for local people too. The small fishermen of Marseille will once again be able to make their living right outside their city. It will take decades for the sea to recover completely. There is now a glimmer of hope. The expedition's next destination is Corsica. This is an exceptional location for divers. The visibility of the water is famous, and there are more than just shipwrecks to explore beneath the waves. Just outside the town of Calvi, an American bomber crashed into the sea. Unlike the wreck of the Donateur, hardly any life has settled here. Perhaps it's simply too small to make an attractive home for fish. Not far away lies the nature reserve of Scondola where Fred has been given an exceptional permission to dive. 
For all other divers, this area is a strict no-go zone. The sheer diversity of life here is not at all evident from the word go. But Skondola is home to some exceptional treasures of the Mediterranean Sea. Huge rock outcrops have created an exceptional habitat complete with canyons and rock overhangs that provide secure living quarters for a myriad of creatures. And that applies not only to fish, but also a completely different type of organism, the rare red corals of the Mediterranean. Red corals are strictly protected here. They've been popular assets for jewelry for thousands of years, but over time, their merciless exploitation has reduced their numbers greatly. But the beauty of these corals is most evident when they're still alive. Once turned into jewelry, Nothing is left of the fragile coral polyps that once live in these calcareous structures. Occasionally, there are also completely white corals. The hordes of hobby divers found on the wreck of the Donateur would be a disaster for this finely tuned ecosystem it would spell the end for this coral colony. But long-term observations have shown that these coral colonies are gradually improving. Harvesting corals has been a long tradition in Corsica. But these days, only a handful of professional coral divers are still allowed to harvest them outside the protected areas. In Bonifacio, in the south of Corsica, Fred meets Jean-Philippe Giordano, one of the last men to make his living from the corals. He's not only a diver, but also crafts the coral jewelry himself. The coraleur has become an extremely rare occupation. Jean-Philippe knows the few hidden places along the coast of Bonifacio where corals can still be found. While Fred dives without the aid of air tanks, just like the coral divers of the past, modern scuba diving equipment allows a much longer search underwater. But despite this, being a coral diver is still very dangerous. The long dives at considerable depths have cost many a coral collector their life. Jean-Philippe collects the corals by hand, and only as many as he can currently work on. One of the reasons why corals cannot be cultivated is that their growth rates are extremely slow, only a few millimeters every year. So it takes decades for the tiny polyps to build up a structure of just a few centimeters. Collecting them is back-breaking work. The coraleur has to leave many corals standing to allow them sufficient time to recover. To follow Jean-Philippe, Fred has to dive to almost 50 meters. There are hardly any corals left in shallower waters. The industrial harvest of corals involves nets that are dragged over the ground and destroy large areas of the seabed completely. It is now strictly prohibited around Corsica. There is hope that over time these protective measures will allow coral stocks to recover here. But the successful search for corals is only the beginning of the coraleur's work. Cool. 
Even today, the most beautiful corals used for jewelry still come from the Mediterranean. While most other types of corals cannot be used for jewelry because they're too brittle, the Mediterranean coral has a particularly beautiful, colored, hard, calcareous exoskeleton that can be worked on with ease. Legend has it that the corals were made from the blood of the Medusa when Perseus cut off her head. Today, their color only serves as a reminder of the beautiful contrast of the red corals against the blue of the sea. Back at the coast of the French Mediterranean, Fred visits one of the oldest nature reserves here, the island of port -Cole. It is under constant observation from park rangers to ensure its protection. port -Cole was turned into a French national park in 1963. It was the first national park in Europe that combines both land and sea. The island is surrounded by a protected zone of 600 meters, which includes a number of smaller islets. Once in private ownership, the island was turned over to the French state by its former owners, under the provision that the island's natural beauty would be preserved and the building of hotels prohibited. Fred meets the representative of the park's management, Nicolas Giratin. He's particularly proud that the endangered stocks of dusky groupers in this protected area are gradually beginning to recover. The, the increase in the populations of groupers are very significant because uh, we, we were counting about 40 groupers in Lilo de la Gabinière in 1985, and now we are about to 200 on, on this same place, and altogether it's between five and 600 around the island. In 1985, we had some, something like 40 groupers and about 1,200 dive every year. If you compare 1,200 dive, 1,200 flashlights towards 40 groupers, they, they might get mad in, in a few months, you know, because no one of us could uh, stand such a treatment. The other problem was that it's easier to make a photograph of a grouper to make him come towards you than to try and chase him. The groupers love boiled eggs. 40 groupers, 1,200 12, uh, uh, boiled eggs, they might be sick in, in a few weeks if everybody brings boiled, egg, boiled eggs. So we had to uh, avoid the people and, and recommend to the divers that they wouldn't bring any food to the fish because we, apart from the fish, we need to maintain a, a biological chain and, and not interfere with it. I think the National Park of Porco were a pioneer in a way to use uh, apnees and free divers for scientific work. The apnea is the best way, it's the most natural way to get into the water, the most silent way without any uh, noise in the water, but also any noise outside when you have to pump the lungs and all the logistics which is behind. The waters of port -Cole are now so carefully monitored that to dive here requires a special permission from the National Park authorities. It is only granted if the strict regulations are followed. To conduct population surveys of dusky groupers, the rangers tend to work together with free divers like Fred. It means minimum disturbance to the environment and its inhabitants. Since the fish are curious and not at all shy, they make an easy target for hunters. And although population numbers of dusky groupers in these protected waters have increased tenfold in the last decade, they are still an endangered species. Only during the mating season do the males get a little testy 
and see anything and anyone as a potential rival. Under the water surface, the visitor is confronted with a myriad of different landscapes. Rocky mountains are dissected with light valleys covered with seagrass. The seagrass meadows are home to an astonishing array of animals and plants, and their dense roots help to stabilize the sea floor. But this delicate carpet is easily damaged by dragnets and ship's anchors. And since seagrass grows and recolonizes only slowly, entire underwater meadows can be quickly and seriously damaged, threatening the survival of the entire habitat. It's a tranquil underwater oasis on the edge. But there is a completely different underwater world, one hidden from view. Fred and Will prepare to meet a particular challenge, a journey into the deep with no easy escape to the water surface. Caves, dark, hidden, and mysterious. This is a world that puts high demands on the abilities of the free divers. The entrance alone lies 20 meters below the surface. It harbors a bizarre spectacle. Stalactites and stalagmites are witnesses of a bygone age when this cave lay suspended high above the water surface. what happens if the divers run out of air. It is impossible to resurface right in the middle of the cave. But there is a secret air-filled chamber. Since the oxygen content of this air is very low, they have to use it with care. The divers cannot afford to waste this precious reserve. They will need it for the return journey. Nevertheless, the divers can go on small excursions from here. For the flexible free divers, this maze of stone doesn't pose a threat. But a diver with air tanks might find himself in peril. The cumbersome equipment could get caught in the nooks and crannies. The divers find no signs of life in the darkness of this cave. Time to make the journey back to the cave entrance, back to fresh air.
to survive such a dangerous adventure requires supreme ability, self-control, and fitness. It is nothing for the faint-hearted. Fred describes what he has seen to Christian. This cave was really an amazing experience. Even the journey into the cavern was worth it. It's superb, but we had to be very careful. Yes, you were gone for 62 minutes from the moment you started your dive. From the boat, we could see you disappear, and then you didn't resurface for 62 minutes. We had to be careful. It was a little dicey getting through that maze of stalactites and stalagmites, but it was an amazing experience. These stalactites and stalagmites are proof that this cave was above the waterline around 12 to 15,000 years ago. The sea level was about 120 meters lower then. All of these caves that you can find around here, including the famous Cascade Cave with its ancient cave paintings, now have an underwater entrance. But now they're slowly back on their way up. If you're interested, I know Pierre Chavaldonnet, who's a cave specialist. We could visit him. I think he'd be very interested to meet a free diver, because they have trouble trying to collect samples from some of the caves. So he works on the fauna of these caves. They have to dive with air tanks, and that produces a lot of bubbles, which can destroy the fragile cave ecosystems. We can go and talk to him. Yes, good idea. I'd be really keen to meet him and get a chance to see that. So the Galabon makes its way back to Marseille. At the university's Institute for Oceanography, some sponge organisms found in the caves have attracted a lot of attention from scientists. It is thought that the sponges produce a certain toxin that could be beneficial in the treatment of illnesses like cancer and AIDS. Fred is on his way to find out more. Yesterday we, we dove in the um, Tripri cave. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. I love the dive with all these stalactite and this tunnel. And now I would like to know a bit more about uh, the life in the underwater cave because I couldn't see any fish. So I bet there is other form of life that are very interesting. Yes, and you know there there are many different kinds of, of caves. There are big caves and, and small caves. And this one is one of the biggest caves in the area. And you have also some, some other caves, like the Three PP Cave in La Ciota, uh, which is going downslope when you're mm -hmm. entering the cave. And you will notice if you go there that the, the waters are actually colder when, you, when you're getting in the cave because the, the, the cold water is denser and it's, it's heavier, so it stays in the, in the, in the lower parts of the, of the cave. And these caves are very interesting because they, they are like the deep sea. You know, in a cave you have no light, uh, you have uh, almost no currents, and, uh, and therefore you have almost no food coming in uh, to, the, to the animals living in there. And um, we don't have all the, you know, very often the, the occasion to go to the deep sea, so this is a, an opportunity to, to put our tanks and, uh, and go in, the, in those caves and study animals that otherwise can only be studied with, with submarines and, uh, or robots. So can you actually stay a long, a long time uh, underwater and uh, long enough to, to get to the, uh, to the very end of those long caves to, to collect uh, some samples maybe? This is interesting because in this, in this cave we have a problem with, with our own bubbles from the, from the, the scuba apparatus. We, we actually generate big bubbles that uh, are disturbing uh, the, uh, the environment. 
and it is disturbing in, in many different ways. Uh, I told you in caves usually you have you have no currents, and those bubbles are actually creating currents in the caves. So they are disturbing the, the very fragile equilibrium in the caves. And furthermore, there um, some of those deep sea sponges living on the on the walls of the of the cave. They are actually they can be detached just mechanically. They can be detached by the uh, by the the big bubble the, our bigger bubbles, and so. Um, Maybe it's uh, an interesting thing if you if you can go out and uh, very smoothly and uh, and collect things without disturbing the environment. That would be interesting for us. I'm going diving in the cave tomorrow, so maybe we can go and dive together. Well, unfortunately, tomorrow I cannot come with you, but uh, I suggest I send my assistant Livia. Can can you come? And uh, she she can come with you. Uh, she can go Hello. with you on the boat, okay, okay. and uh, and then she would take care of the of the samples you, you will bring back. From, uh, on the ship okay and um, bring them back to the lab okay. Okay. okay wonderful let's do that the bay of la ciota this is the location of the cave now it's essential to have a really professional briefing it could be a matter of survival so like we say will uh, we dive together at the same time so you can film and put more light, because otherwise I don't have enough light, huh? So okay. I'll be slightly to your left and behind. Yes, that will be perfect. You. Okay. We watch each other's, okay? Yeah. Signal me if uh, if you run out of air. I signal you also, so we, you know, uh, do the exactly the same time, huh? Okay. okay? Yeah. On the way up, we watch each other's. Uh, it should be okay. 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 And Christian's gonna provide I safety stay outside, on okay. the outside, uh, watching. I'm checking your time. Okay. Yeah. So if there is a problem, uh, yes, like I after two and a half or three minutes, I'm you can ready get to in. Go in the cave, but uh, yes, not more one and a half minutes uh, inside we need, the cave. Yeah, but yeah, we yeah. will need yeah, yeah. more than two minutes, I think. <clears throat> so just be ready. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Total dive from surface to surface should be three minutes maximum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we try maximum to keep it minutes. between two and two thirty, but yeah. if but not more than three minutes. Yeah. Huh? After two minutes, I come in the cave. Okay. Most important point of the dive is that we don't go too low or too high. Mm. We go too low, we stir up the bottom of the cave. We go too high, we risk running into something. So I'll try and keep the light shining on you to illuminate you so I can film you, but also somewhat in front so you can see clearly what you need to, to find mm. uh, the stuff we need. Okay. Christian thinks the risk is high. I still think this is a dangerous undertaking. But it's well organized, and since they're professionals, aware of the dangers involved, it is possible to have a go. But for amateurs, it would be impossible. After all, the cave entrance alone lies 17 meters below the water surface. Then he has to cover an additional 50 meters, and once in the cavern, it's impossible to get to the surface. So he'll have to collect some sponges for analysis and then make the 50 meters journey back. That's about 140 meters all told. 100 meters of that, he can't come up for air. If he stays down for more than two minutes, I'll go into the cave to see what's going on. But Fred and Will are confident in their abilities and go ahead with the dive. Okay, Christian, our dive will be maximum three minutes. Okay, but uh, don't stay more one and a half minute inside the cave. We'll try to do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I try to get the sponge okay. in less I than one and a half minutes. I stay outside the cave, okay. I waiting to you, and I checking the time, and uh, uh, after one and a half minute, I enter in the group. <laughs> we'll try to do as fast as we can. Okay. okay.
it's a relief for the crew to see the divers surfacing again. The assignment is complete. Soon these small bits of rocks and sponges will be examined under a microscope in Marseille. Fred doesn't show any signs of exhaustion from his challenging dive. Hello? How was it? Okay. Everything's fine. It wasn't too hard? No, it might have been a little long, but it was okay. How far was it? 30 or 40 meters. Ah, there's Christian. Everything all right? Yes, but you did give me a little bit of a fright. You were in too long. It takes its time. Yeah, of course. I dove down to the center and arrived before the time limit and took the sample. I was really stressed because of the time limit. But then I could see you. I was just about to go in myself. Really? Okay, it's done. We have the sponge. But the sponges cannot survive for long in their small glass containers. The team makes their way back to Marseille. There is hope for the damaged waters of the Mediterranean. On their journey, Fred and Will have found healthy and recovering habitats, places where a surprising diversity of life manages to survive, and the efforts of people to clean up their coastlines and nurture life back are encouraging. Perhaps the Mediterranean will once again become the underwater Eden it once was. What do you think after this trip, Will, and uh, the Mediterranean? Completely changed my opinion. I'm really surprised. There's a lot of fish, a lot of beautiful dive sites. Um, one of the, I'd say, one, in the top five of places I've dove in the world. Really? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it was incredible. What was really impressive was the variety of opportunities to dive, the, the bottom contours, the rock formations, the abundance of fish, the different wrecks. I told you, it's, it can be surprising. Very. <laughs> this is the biggest predator in the ocean, the great white shark. It can reach six meters in length and weigh in at over 2,000 kilograms. A supreme hunter equipped with rows of serrated teeth and an arsenal of super senses. An encounter with this apex predator in its own element is the stuff of nightmares for most, an experience only few would actively see. Three extraordinary divers are on their way to undertake the experiment of a lifetime. They're heading to the notorious hunting grounds of one of the most feared predators on the planet, the island of Guadalupe. This dedicated team of experts is preparing to launch a unique expedition into the realm of the great white shark. Their aim is to contribute to cutting edge research into the true nature of this legendary beast. They'll go face to face with great whites in their own element. Their only protection, years of experience and incredible self-control. They want to challenge the popular myth of an aggressive, bloodthirsty monster. I think what we do is really bringing powerful images that are able to change people's opinion. He's the master of the sea. He's the absolute hunter. He's at the top of the food chain and fears no one. This is almost the top predator in the ocean, and it has the myth behind it. I'm more afraid than to live in a world without sharks than to meet sharks in the water. San Diego, California. The expedition prepares for their extraordinary journey on board of the Islander. Amongst the crew members, three of the best free divers in the world. The Belgian Frédéric Bouilly, former world record holder that has now devoted himself to underwater photography. The Canadian record holder William Winram. And world champion Pierre Froulat von Monaco managed to go below the 127 meter mark. They're ready to begin their journey into Pacific waters. 
Highly specialized camera equipment is part of their comprehensive kit to capture a meeting between man and beast unlike anything ever seen before. Isolated volcanic island of Guadalupe lies 250 kilometers off the Mexican mainland, a day's journey by boat. Time to discuss the immense task ahead. Cameraman Christian Petron brings almost 50 years as a renowned underwater cinematographer to the table. Eventually, the island of Guadalupe appears on the horizon. A harsh, barren rock without any fresh water. Only a handful of fishermen have settled here. Fur and elephant seals enjoy the peace and tranquility and were found in huge numbers right up to the 19th century. Then, the greed of human hunters all but exterminated them. The hunters brought goats with them, which soon eradicated the island's natural vegetation cover. Fortunately, the rocky cliffs gave shelter to a few surviving Guadalupe fur seals and northern elephant seals. Over the last century, their population has slowly begun to recover. Today, the island is a strictly protected nature reserve. Only one hunter is still allowed to pursue seals around here, the great white shark. The new thing in Guadalupe is, of course, the amount of sharks. There are more sharks, they are easier to find. In South Africa, we need to do long boat trips uh, and spend hours and hours before seeing a shark. Apparently, there's more than 150 sharks in the area in the big bay, so that's a lot of animals. And at some point, they will come across us. Uh, so that's the main difference. Uh, the other difference is that the visibility is really better than in South Africa. So most of the, the people say that the, the sharks are more uh, fast and more aggressive than in South Africa, probably because of visibility. Uh, so that could be uh, not in our favor, because it means the shark could spot us from very deep water and rocket to the surface. Um, in my opinion, that won't happen, because the great white shark is an apex predator and never, he never takes risk to get a prey. So he will first come around us and check us out to see what we are and how we react. So I don't think we will be really bothered by the, the visibility, but as a lot of people told us that, we will be very careful for the first dives. But the crew is not yet complete. The Mexican marine biologist, Dr. Mauricio Hoyos, joins the team on board. Hey. Hi, Frank. How are you? Fine, you. How was the trip? Good, huh? Good condition. Flat sea. No waves. Comfortable. For five months a year, he is based on the island to conduct his field research. Hey. <laughs> Good to see you. Mauricio specializes on the hunting behavior of great white sharks and hopes the free divers will enable him to find out more about their natural behavior in these coastal waters. Will they perceive the free divers as a threat? Will they attack? Or will they tolerate them? But this experiment is very risky. Safety driver Luke Tipple is in charge of planning the dives. He has constructed a special cage for the dives that will be suspended around 10 meters below the water surface. It will serve as a launching pad for the free divers and will grant protection for the camera team that will remain within the safety of the cage. Luke will only be able to watch the free divers' backs in the open water. The rest is up to them. Diving without a cage or protective gear means the divers are completely exposed. Captain Shane Slaughter shares his thoughts with the crew. 
Just the only one thing I would add about the sharks is if you see them down deep and you see any of them tilted on their side a little bit, like they're looking up at you, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a red flag. Also, any of them that, you know, if they're not swimming level on the water and you're up here, the shark is here, and if they swim sideways a little bit like that, they're eyeing you for some, some reason. And that's one thing that I've seen diving in there. It's an indicator one of them's gonna come up at some point. So just watch for that. Anything additional which might help us? Um, other than recommending you guys don't go in the water without a cage, no. <laughs> <laughs> Diving cages are used across the world for secure dives with sharks. To lure sharks into the vicinity of the cages, blood and fish are usually used as bait. It provides a cheap thrill for tourists, since the blood and carcasses provoke the shark's aggressive feeding instinct and trigger a feeding frenzy. I'm very pleased with the cage. Uh, I designed it specifically to offer both surface and uh, underwater support and to be able to be pushed away from the main vessel. Uh, great white sharks attack from deep cover. You pretty much always see the shark coming from underneath the boat in the shadow. Being able to push our cage and our uh, surface support away from the boat offers less places for the shark to come from. I communicate with them uh, with my uh, stick, so I, I use a metallic banging to, uh, to get their attention, and then we use signals like uh, two sharks, and they confirm two sharks. If I'm saying three sharks and they're saying two sharks, that means that there's one more that they don't see that they need to be aware of. Uh, that's one of my primary jobs down there, other than just looking after the camera guys, is making sure that I'm seeing that bit below where they can't. Uh, which can be an issue. That extra 30, 40, 50 feet of visibility um, can mean the difference between there being two sharks and five sharks. Paramedic Tiffany Potker is a vital member of the team. Should a diver get injured in a shark attack, she may well be their only hope of survival and she is only too aware of the risks involved in this experiment. I try to think, as far as preparation goes, what could be worst case scenario. You know, we're, we're a few hours out of range for Coast Guard here, and we would have to meet them a couple hours going towards San Diego if this were like worst case scenario. So worst case scenario, yes, a shark attack. Say a wound were to be on, on your thigh here, you'd put the tourniquet above that. Um, you're cutting off circulation to the rest of the limb too, so that's your last ditch effort. You know, you want to save the limb if possible as well, but it's life over limb, so. Hopefully I won't have to work, but I know there's a good chance that I may. Everything is set for the first diving attempt. Will the sharks come? How long will it take before they show up? Oh, yeah. Then, big one, huh? <laughs> the crew spots a shadow yeah, yeah, in the water. Yeah. Great. A massive shadow. We will not have lunch today. Fin. The shark, perhaps, but not us. Yeah, it's just yeah. about four meters, huh? yeah, yeah, yeah. but thick. Yeah. Time for cameraman Christian Petron and his team to get ready. As far as I'm concerned, a diver using the rebreather technique, like me, is the same as a free diver. He doesn't make any noise and no bubbles. A scuba diver using compressed air makes lots of bubbles and lots of noise and disturbs the sharks. Like I just said, a free diver and a diver using the rebreather technique are more or less the same because they don't disturb the sharks, because they don't make bubbles, and because they don't make any noise. But using a rebreather also carries serious risks. Should the proportion of oxygen mixed into the reused air be too low, the diver will fall asleep underwater forever.
Everyone knows exactly what they're doing. This experiment has been meticulously planned. But now all bets are off. No one knows exactly what will happen once the three free divers are in the water. Dr. Mauricio Hoyos is watching the proceedings intently. If you are diving, you have to hold your breath because if you if you uh, emit these bubbles, the shark is going to go away. When we were diving yesterday, and the shark was uh, really close to us, but when it heard the, the bubbles, it was away from us. We wanted to take pictures, but we couldn't because we were going off with the bubbles. But with this, with free diving, it's perfect because no sound. So I think that the shark doesn't feel like uh, breathing. Then, a bizarre turn of events. As soon as the divers get into the water, the shark that a moment ago was calmly circling the boat has vanished. These huge hunters can materialize and disappear in a split second, even in the crystal clear waters of the Pacific. Yet another reason to be extremely cautious. Pierre searches the depths for any signs of sharks. Perhaps he can attract the shark? Some free divers are able to reach incredible depths of over 130 meters in the open ocean and stay underwater for over seven minutes. But these are record-breaking dives. In this situation, they're unlikely to exceed depths of around 50 meters and may stay there for up to five minutes. This incredible ability is a result of extreme physical training and incredible self-control to overcome the breathing reflex. Suddenly, they catch a glimpse of movement far below. As the shark returned to investigate the divers, the shadow doesn't approach them. William decides to turn the tables on the shark and approaches it. How will the predator react? The shark doesn't accept the challenge. Once again, he vanishes into the blue of the ocean. The divers can't get anywhere near the shark. This killer could make short work of each of the divers with just a single bite, but it cautiously stays away. He decides how close they can come. There are no signs of aggression, but also no fear. Against all expectations, this first shark encounter has exposed the great whites as cautious, even shy animals. If you go in front of them, they can be afraid. So they take a distance. It's called a security distance. For every animal, they have their own security distance. With the big sharks, it's new for them to have uh, free divers in the water. Yes, yes. Actually, there's going to be a meeting. Dr. Mauricio Hoyos has worked with sharks for years and explains his research strategy. He fits sharks with transmitters that allow him to track their movements closely. Last year, I set uh, three receivers on this bay, and I tagged the sharks with uh, pingers. So with these pingers, you can know just the absence and the presence of the sharks. I tagged the sharks in October, and I saw that they were here in October, November, December, January, and February, most of them. And suddenly, they disappeared. With other kind of uh, satellite transmitters, they have found that the sharks can go as far as Hawaii, and also to one spot between Hawaii and Guadalupe Island, and they remain there for about 160 days, and then they come again to Guadalupe Island. So with that, you will be able to see where they get the seal, how they predate on them somehow, exactly. because you can see where they are in the water column. Exactly, the predatory movements when the shark is chasing the, the seal. Maybe I will be able to, to see if other sharks are together, if they are uh, hunting together, because that's one theory that the white sharks can hunt together. You think we can help you by our free dive with the, the great white and our cameras? You think we can help you somehow? Yes, I think. I think that it would be really important for me to identify the shark. 
So if you could look for the conspicuous uh, characteristics such as uh, birthmarks or scars or even the pigmentation patterns of the gills, mm -hmm. the pelvic fins and the tail, that would be great. If you could take pictures of left and right side, that would be amazing. Also, if you can take footage or even see the, the behavior underwater because it's really different when they are at the surface feeding that when they are deep below the, the, the surface. Maybe we can try to, if you could uh, try to tag the sharks. And we, I mean, uh, but that's what I need now trouble. because on the surface, it's going to be impossible. The next day brings bad news. Storm clouds are gathering. Conditions deteriorate rapidly. The shark experiment grinds to an abrupt halt. All of a sudden, the wind changed from the valley to this direction here. So this is what we've got. It's cold. The divers get out of the water quickly. The waves threaten to throw the cage against the boat. It has to be lifted. The paramedic has to deal with her first casualty. Pierre collided with a jellyfish in the water. A very painful <laughs> encounter. I need a medic. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Dangerous, ah, uh, the sea, huh? So dangerous. Sting right on the lip. White shark! <laughs> Jellyfish! As the storm intensifies, the boat's anchor threatens to tear loose. It has to be lifted. I think we're gonna run down to the south end and see if we can get out of this wind. There's no time to lose. They have to seek shelter in a bay. They stand no chance of finding the sharks in this weather. Wind, waves, and currents are all working against them. But Captain Snotter has other ways of keeping track of the great whites. We're gonna try to actively try to find uh, good shark action here for the next couple days. Real similar in the way that we look for fish. Uh, we basically use the side scan sonar and we pick up schools of tuna anywhere from you know, maybe uh, 10 pounds all the way up to, you know, 80 or 100 pounds. So it's really easy for us to see a 3,000 pound shark on sonar. So we'll sweep around the different areas and if we see a good possibility for sharks, we'll uh, go ahead and start our operations there. Okay, you guys ready to go find sharks? Okay, let's go. But while the team has no choice but to wait for the sharks, Pierre has found a distraction. A young storm petrel has become stranded on board. Uh, they used to see the, um, the lights on the boat during the night, and they come on the boat. It's very small. It's called a frigate in French. I don't know in English. And he's wet. He needs to be dried. And he seems to be not in good form, huh? so he needs help. And he can't, he can't uh, fly, you see? He wants to move, but he can't fly, so... We try to help him, to feed him, and we will see, huh? Now, we go in a hot place to help the bird. Look at him. We could help him, perhaps. We have to feed him, it's difficult to feed a, a, a bird like that. Huh? Could be fun to try. Pierre takes his newfound responsibility seriously, especially since the wind and waves have driven the sharks into deeper waters until the storm has lifted. There's no way for the divers to reach them there. It's frustrating, but all they can do is wait. I don't think sharks are lurking out in the water wanting to eat human beings. I think that, you know, they're active all of the time and they're constantly hunting. If you present yourself in a similar place, time and behavior as their prey, they will probably uh, 
taste to. But, uh, you know, I mean, I've been in the water with the tiger sharks, I've been in the water with lots of other different sharks, and they seem to be more curious than ever aggressive with us. There is a possible lead in the search for the vanished great whites, tracking down their main prey animals. As inhospitable as this isolated island may seem, for some creatures, it's paradise and a safe haven. Northern elephant seals enjoy the seclusion. It has saved them from certain extermination at the hands of greedy hunters. Elephant seals are the biggest seals in the world. Bulls can grow to an astonishing six and a half meters and weigh in at up to three and a half tons. Despite their ungainly appearance on land, they are adept underwater acrobats and hunters, able to pursue fish and octopuses down to an astonishing depth of 600 meters. But out in the open ocean, hunters can quickly become the hunted. This seal has been the recent victim of a vicious attack, a shark attack. It's a sure sign that the sharks are back in the coastal waters of Guadalupe. Blood traces show where the injured animal returned to land. But it will survive. Many seals in this colony bear serious scars from shark attacks. They're not entirely without protection on the water. Their blubber acts like a shield, not only against the cold, but also against the jagged teeth of the great white shark. Christian Petro and the crew get ready for a renewed search for the sharks. The injured elephant seal has renewed their <laughs> hopes of success. And where better to search for sharks than right next to the colonies of their prey? They explore the waters near the shore and have the unique chance to witness the surprising elegance of the seals underwater at close range. It's the first time uh, uh, we will be diving with elephant seals, so it's... Uh, it's Elephants are all waiting, and we are waiting for them since 35 years. Using small boats, the divers manage to get close to the forbidding rocky coastline. Underwater, they're quickly greeted by curious Guadalupe fur seals. They show no fear and approach the divers at close range. They are the rarest of the southern fur seals and strictly protected. The team are probably the first humans they've come face to face with for a very long time.
elephant seals are less feisty, but they too show no fear. Perhaps they see the divers as animals similar to themselves, and they wouldn't be far from wrong. them because we breathe at the surface where they're breathing at the same time as we were doing. We were looking at each other on the surface and then putting the head down, they were looking at each other. Uh, it's very funny because we are like them. Huh? We breathe and we, we dive, so um, same kind of animals. Maybe we have longer fins and different suits, but it's the same. But still the team hasn't managed to spot any sharks in the shallow coastal water. Where have they gone? Giving up is not an option, so they use a short break to check their equipment and prepare for the next dive. Then, an unexpected visit. The Mexican Navy is suddenly on board of the research vessel armed to the teeth. Christian Petron is alarmed. What do the soldiers want? Could this spell the end of the expedition? The boat is searched from top to bottom. The team's papers checked meticulously and permits examined. No one is allowed in these waters without official permission. Guadalupe is one of the best protected nature reserves in the world. Everyone is nervous. They anxiously await the Navy commander's verdict. Well, we're the Coast Guard, and our job is to stop the drug traffic and illicit activities like shark fishing. Sometimes it's necessary to check people who belong to some TV or magazine who are filming, like you, but they don't have permission. Everything is in order. A sigh of relief ripples through the crew. The soldiers leave them to their shark experiments. The divers quickly take advantage of the remains of the day. They couldn't afford to waste any more time. This break in the bad weather could only be a brief reprieve. but still no sharks. It is a frustrating strain on the team's patience. Pierre tries to raise the shark's curiosity. Perhaps splashing on the water's surface could guide the sharks to them. Something ordinary swimmers and divers should avoid in shark-infested waters at all costs. The three free divers work together. Each one covers the back of another. Should any sharks materialize, they don't want to be taken by surprise. Success. A single great white appears out of the blue. Just one of the free divers will try to approach, while the others watch his back. The cautious tactic pays off. Other sharks join the first, including a surprise visitor. A fur seal brazenly dives right amongst his predators. He's so quick and agile that the sharks don't stand a chance of catching him. They have to rely on surprise attacks to prey on the seals. Gradually, the sharks appear to be getting used to the divers. They become increasingly curious about the visitors, but neither divers nor sharks drop their guard for even a second. If you want to see how an animal behaves, you need to see how he behaves in the real conditions. If you start to use a cage or devices, you trick the game.
Getting this close to the sharks allows the free divers to take detailed photographs of each individual, which Mauricio Hoyos will use to catalog the animals. But the divers have to remain vigilant. The shark in front of them isn't always the only shark around. The shark strategy of attack usually involves a silent approach from behind. William, William, right behind you. Will has a lucky escape. Out here, just one moment of unwariness could cost a diver his life. Tiffany keeps a wary eye on the divers, who are now encircled by sharks. Meanwhile, Dr. Mauricio Hoyos tries to take advantage of the shark's presence. He wants to fit radio transmitters to some of them from the safety of a floating platform. It forms a crucial part of his research and can give vital clues to decode the shark's hunting behavior. The white sharks, they feed on seals and they feed on, the, on, on, on these kind of animals. If they don't uh, control those animals, these animals are going to be like a, a plague, a lot of animals. In the Sea of Cortez, we have a lot of California sea lions because now there are not bull sharks or, or other sharks. And those sea lions are a big problem for fishermen, for instance. Actually, my captain is a fisherman. And he told me that it's a big problem when, when they are retrieving the nets and they can see all the fish bitten by the California sea lions. And they have, there are hundreds of them, but they are not allowed to do anything because the three different species of pinnipeds are protected in Mexican waters. But we have hundreds of them. And it's because of that, because no sharks in the Sea of Cortez. Facing up to a great white out in the open sea requires an extraordinary amount of self-control. Showing panic or fear could provoke an attack. It's even possible that sharks can perceive the electrical impulses of a beating heart. Great White is a hunter. A uh, Great White always arrive in the shadow, always take advantage of his camouflage, and so yeah, to be very, very aware of his position. And if you establish an eye contact with a Great White, no problem. The problem is when you don't have the eye contact with the animal. And uh, every time I've been like a bit surprised by the Great White was because I didn't see the animal arriving before. Again and again, sharks suddenly appear out of the blue and swim straight at the divers. They turn away only at the last moment. Every year, about 60 or 70 shark attacks on people are registered worldwide. But in 2009, only about five of these were fatal. Gradually, the divers managed to get extremely close to the sharks. It allows them to build up an invaluable detailed photographic catalog of the predators for Dr. Oyo's research. Shark science has been turned upside down in recent years. For a long time, it had been assumed that the sharks spend most of their time in coastal waters to hunt sea lions and seals. But with the help of high-tech satellite transmitters, it has become clear that they undertake incredible journeys of several thousand kilometers. During these long-distance migrations, they tend to stay at depths of 300 or 500 meters. But so far, scientists have only been able to observe them near the water's surface. The rest of the sharks' lives remain a mystery. Uh, 
Time for the divers to take a break. They have to. Staying in the water too long could mean a fatal dip in their concentration. Boy, that was great. <laughs> Uh, there's a big, it's like four and a half meter. I can show you the photo. At last minute, they turn. It was uh, taking the opportunity to come from under. And uh, because you don't see it coming from under. So it's really coming at you and doesn't stop, doesn't stop at like 50, 60 centimeters from you. Turns. It's really nice. Very nice. Really interesting. The first time she came right at me, yeah. it, she, it was as soon as I went, <laughs> she, yeah. Yeah, yeah. sorry, she no, started. No. <laughs> like me. <laughs> so. The success of the last few days has given the team enough confidence to attempt the next stage of their expedition, to tag the sharks underwater. Since Mauricio's own efforts to fit transmitters have been unsuccessful, this could be a vital chance to get this crucial part of his research underway. He's installed receivers near seal colonies in three bays around Guadalupe. When a shark, fitted with one of his radio transmitters, approaches, they register the signal. The receivers will be retrieved again in a year's time to analyze the data. Mauricio hopes this data will support his theory that the big females are the most prolific seal hunters, since they need the extra energy provided by the seal blubber. If his assumptions are correct, the receivers will have predominantly registered the approach of females, not those of youngsters and males. The transmitters are attached near the back fin using barbed hooks. Fred, Will, and Pierre carefully prepare the string that attaches the transmitter to the barb. Transmitters are very expensive, and losing any would mean a serious blow to the entire project. To penetrate the tough shark skin, they have to be shot from a harpoon. It takes long years of experience using harpoons to get the aim and moment of release exactly right. But it is a risky undertaking. No one knows how the sharks will react. Pierre seems relaxed, despite the precarious undertaking. Hey, he's always there, waiting for you. He knows that you're coming. Behind you and then the other behind you. I know they know what they're doing. Pretty sure, too, that they can draw the line when, you know, it gets a little bit too dangerous, so. I hope they know where that line is, but I'm, I'm sure they'll, they'll be fine. Mauricio Hoyos is hoping for as many sharks as possible to fit a good number of transmitters. Is that another one, or is the the same, right? But more sharks in the water means a greater risk for the divers. The crew takes the same approach as before and allows the sharks to get used to them in the water first. The plan is for Will to take a photograph before Pierre tries to tag the first shark. Everything is going to plan. Pierre manages to get an ideal position to shoot his harpoon, but then he hesitates. The chance passes. Fred explains what happened. Mauricio, it's one shark with uh, like tags, but like uh, it's not acoustic tags or something. No, but uh, with, with parasites? Yes. Yeah, maybe it's. Uh... The feather, it, it was from a satellite transmitter. Uh, so now it, it has just the, the parasites, I think. So uh, you want us to tag that one? Yes, if, if, you, are, if yeah. you are sure that it's not an acoustic, it's not an acoustic, right? Uh, we will we be sure, but it doesn't seem to be an acoustic. Maybe it's, maybe it's just the feather with yes. the parasites. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The divers make a second attempt, 
But just as he reaches the ideal shooting position, Pierre realizes the danger. Will is immediately in front of the shark. Should the shark get aggressive as a result of the shot, Will would be extremely vulnerable. Pierre has to let the shark go a second time. The tagging is turning out to be extremely difficult. Success is not guaranteed. But an experienced hunter knows patience is top of the list. The divers take their time. Perhaps the shark has noticed some tension among the team. Perhaps the long and unfamiliar harpoons have spooked him. He is very cautious. Then Pierre has another chance. It's a good hit. But the hook didn't bite. The transmitter drops along the line into the depth. The shark has been spooked for good and disappears. Will has found another target and prepares to shoot. While Pierre retrieves his transmitter, Will takes a shot. But the angle is not ideal. The line doesn't release the transmitter. But Will is lucky. Eventually, the line releases the transmitter and the shark disappears. A nervous, aggressive shark is unpredictable. This could have ended very badly. But the transmitter is fixed and well placed. Now everything goes smoothly and the team managed to tag two large females. Did you tag it? Yes. The big female? The big one. Excellent. It's yeah. a female, right? Huh? It's a female. Oh yeah, it's huge. Excellent. Where are the other tags? We have photos. Left and right. Perfect. Oh, the other shark is She's here. She's not there. She's back. Do you take a picture with the transmitter on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. William has a uh, okay. uh, video. Okay. And now I'm going to take a picture. Excellent. This shot was perfect. The transmitter is securely in place and releases the line immediately. Mauricio is elated. Yes, of course. It's a big female. And I think that they are feeding on the seals, the big females. I have seen a lot of females feeding on seals, so this is perfect for the, for the array that I said a few days ago. It has been an exceptional accomplishment. Getting any closer than this to great white sharks in their own element is virtually impossible. Dr. Oyos is particularly interested in hearing as much as possible about the team's underwater observations of the shark's behavior. And what about the behavior of that big female? She was very quiet. Uh, she was coming very close, but uh, in a very uh, soft manner, uh, approaching and not at all inquisitive, just curious. And uh, we could spend time with her swimming alongside. Uh, we had a lot of fun with that shark. Always on the surface. With yes, it. yes, yes. I mean, not at all aggressive. Yeah, no, and sometimes uh, with the, the fin and the tail outside yeah. of the water, but we could cruise with her. She was yeah. totally accepting us. Yeah. Was, oh, very nice. Here's. Oh, that's, is that the, the transmitter? Yeah. That's yes. perfect. Yeah. Perfect tagging. <laughs> this and on the left side, you can see exactly. that she's yeah, totally yeah. clean. You look at the size of the transmitter. It looks like. <laughs> it looks yeah, like yeah, this. Tiny. Yeah. 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 But uh, we have it on film also. The tagging, yeah? uh, placement yeah. of the transmitters. I don't know that female. Maybe she's new. Mm -hmm. I don't know that female. And this afternoon we saw another big female, huh? new, no tag on it, but huh? we couldn't uh, get Bigger it. than this one? Or? No, same size, but uh, not as fat. Thank you very much for your help. Without your help, this couldn't be impossible because I had been trying to tag the sharks for 
one week and they have been really deep all the time. Yeah. So for me, I was there in my skiff and waiting, waiting and nothing at the surface. But I saw the, the sharks when they were mm -hmm. swimming below me like 10 meters. So I stacked two big females today. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want because I have seen the big females feeding on the seals. And that's why I said this array of Sunnibush in front of the seal colony. Okay. With those transmitters, we are going to know the three-dimensional movements of the sharks when they are looking for the, for the seals. Let us know when you have results. I will uh, next year. be really curious. Yeah. Next year. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> they are convinced their experiences with the sharks can do something towards changing their reputation as bloodthirsty killers. You, you can really explain to the people they are nice animals it's all the picture you see of great white sharks and the film it's always with the mouth open going at the camera but you have to know it if they do that it's because you had a lot of blood and bait in the water yeah. sometimes even uh, bait on the camera or on the cage so they <coughs> go there and uh, yeah, to, yeah, to yeah, have yeah. like kind of spectacular and images really yeah. but when they don't have bait they're just curious they want to see what we are and they stay for 15 20 minutes yeah. then they are gone but yeah. they it's never really open the jaws the only time we was a little bit worried is uh, when uh, William tagging the shark, when I saw the shark, I, I say, oh my God, he take in the passage. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, oof, he's gone. But uh, it's only time I was very worried because the shark was shy. And the eye is not dark. Ah, you it's saw black. it's blue. Yeah. Yeah. It's blue. The great white shark yeah. eye is uh -huh. blue. It's blue not eye. black. Everybody you says they have like a make deep a song. black blue, eye yeah. without any expression. If you really go close to a great white shark, you will see it's a black eye with a blue circle and it's absolutely beautiful. What we do really helps uh, people to have a different perspective about, uh, about sharks. That island is a very nice place for the great white, but perhaps one, one of the last. So humans have to take care about sea life and the watermans we are have to show that Shark is not dangerous, he's curious, and he lives in the sea. He's in his place, so we have to respect that. We yes, are just visitors. Yeah. It's possible their groundwork will have paved the way to new groundbreaking insights into the true nature of one of the greatest hunters in the sea. They're known as the rainforests of the sea, coral reefs, some of the most diverse ecosystems on Earth. Despite the serene impression, this is no paradise. Predators roam the reefs, and stiff competition for space and food makes life incredibly tough. So how do reef inhabitants get through a day to find out and experience life on the reef, you first have to become part of it. The South Pacific, where coral reefs act as a barrier to waves and storms, a world of small islands and open sea. They form a realm of their own, which opens up to those willing to adapt to its rules. Intimate encounters with the creatures of the reefs are only possible if the divers are prepared to enter their world without the comforts of technology. This is the product of nature's luxurious bounty, as it can be seen hardly anywhere else on Earth. French Polynesia is the ideal location for marine biologists to study this highly complex ecosystem beneath the waves. That's why Moria is the base for French and American university research stations. This is their starting point for research excursions into the tropical sea of French Polynesia. This time, they've teamed up with the French underwater cameraman Christian Petron and two underwater specialists, the world-class freedivers Frédéric Bouille and William Winram. The two divers work as a highly experienced team and can rely on each other in every situation the sea might throw at them. They know the waters of the South Pacific well. Diving here with whales and sharks is nothing new for them. Fred has come here to meet Professor Serge Plan on Maria. 
a French researcher specializing on the underwater fauna of French Polynesia. So Fred, um, I'm glad you're here in Moya. My interest in having you here is your capability of um, staying in the water uh, without breathing for uh, some time. Um, and especially re regarding uh, the, the analysis and uh, the survey of the behavior of the, uh, the fauna uh, we have on the sea. And you think as a freediver I can help you with that? The interest is that for doing sampling, uh, you can always do that with doing bubbles, with scuba tank on the classical tool. But as soon as you're looking at behavior, as soon as you're interested in uh, how a fish or uh, how a worm or how a shrimp react towards another one or towards regarding reproduction or regarding some kind of activity, the noise that bubbles are making uh, are certainly, uh, and it's been shown that it's disturbing partly this activity and it's also then and it's then difficult to uh, really understand what is part of the natural behavior from what is uh, a part of the a reaction of the behavior related to bubble. The disturbance. The disturbance. Okay. So. Corif are in some ways the equivalent of tropical rainforest that you find in the Amazon. Corif are supposed to be the sources of high diversity ecosystem. I'd say that the, the reef itself is based on a few animals that are numerous in numbers, but they are creating themselves a high diversity pool. It's known to be about 20,000 species of fish. That is almost 50% of all fish inhabiting the earth, um, just in coral reef. But related to that, it's only about 1,500 species of coral. So it's a few number of, of species of coral creating a huge diversity. And actually, there is now estimate that there is already 20% of reef that are gone. And there's about 30 to 40% that we think they're in high danger of disappearing. And then the rest that is more or less going a little bit better. Corals are the building blocks of the reef, but are highly sensitive to temperature fluctuations. That's why global warming could be particularly harmful to them. And once they've been damaged, recovery is a slow and unpredictable process. It creates a disastrous chain reaction. Once the coral is gone, all the species that depend on it will also disappear. That's why more research and further insights into the complex reef ecosystems are so important. In order to save them, detailed knowledge of their intricate workings is essential. Fred, William, and Christian are hoping to help gain further crucial insights. The team gets ready for their first reef dive, a night dive. So we, we're going to, to follow the scientists with the lights and, uh, and see what's happening. Uh, it's a new experience, so we'll see. While the free divers have no technical equipment at all, the specialist camera gear used to record the dive is incredibly heavy. It's dark. Not diving is dark, there's no light, so uh, you have different animals that go outside. Uh, some animals are sleeping, some animals are more active, so that's the main difference. Uh, in terms of diving, it doesn't change anything, and, uh, but uh, sometimes it's, it's nice to do some night dive. It's not my favorite thing, uh, because I like to enjoy the scenery more, but uh, it's fun from time to time. And uh, here, I think we'll have very good condition on a shallow reef, so it's going to be a good dive. But first, the team head for the Berkeley University Research Station to pick up a further specialist, Professor Gustav Paule of the University of Florida. He is an expert on invertebrate animals. There will be no moon in the sky tonight, 
ideal conditions to observe a very special event, the arrival of new reef inhabitants in their millions. This night is of particular interest for Gustav Paule. In the dead of night, millions of larvae drift with the currents towards the island. The eggs of the animals populating the lagoon reach maturity on the ocean floor or even out in the open sea. Now the freshly hatched larvae are ready to return to the lagoon. Drifting on the currents under cover of night, they do what they can to avoid falling prey to larger predators. The reef itself is not very impressive, but the tumbling clouds of larvae are breathtaking. A few years ago, the corals here fell victim to an invasion of crown of thorn starfish that feed on the delicate coral polyps. It's been a recurring problem in French Polynesia. Corals on several reefs have already met the same fate and have been almost completely wiped out. anything uh, a lot of uh, larvae larvas in the in the water but beside that nothing the following day Fred meets up with professor Paul the larvae may seem insignificant but they form a vital part of the scientists plan to understand the entire coral reef ecosystem Doing? Looking at some larvae. Oh, the larvae we cooked yesterday during the night dive? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So there's a whole bunch of different species. Mm -hmm. These are some of the samples in here. Yeah, there's a lot of larvae. Really big in the ones. Water. Okay. And these are for larvae, for uh, larvae of marine life. This is very large. Yes. So most things have tiny larvae, but mm -hmm. these are for uh, stomatopods, mantis shrimp, the big prawn killers. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are probably about an inch long, more than an inch, yes. two, two, three centimeters. And there were lots and lots of them coming mm -hmm. in on the reef. So we got a really nice sample to play with. <laughs> nice. So we'll see what kind of species they are and how many we got and um, make uh, preserve samples from everything mm -hmm. and then get some images of them and get DNA samples. OK? So we'll get a little bit of everything. Not much on the reef, though, but... Uh, Not this time, no. Yeah, no, but yeah. in open water, it was just crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, th this reef here has died in, in a lot of ways because of the crown of thorns, acanthaster, yeah. yeah. So the corals are too few and far between. So even when they spawn, it's not going to be exciting. <laughs> no, no. But I'm hoping that when the, the worms come out and the sea cucumbers come out, it's going to be good. So You go back in? Yep. Yeah, tonight? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Every night until... Uh, well, for a couple of nights. Okay. I got mm. two more nights before I have to leave the island. So yeah, it's uh, run out of time, but at least we are here for this cycle. So nice. I want to take advantage of it. From Maria, the team move on to the next station of their mission. Rangiroa, the biggest coral atoll in French Polynesia. Atolls are the remains of old islands that submerge beneath the waves, while the surrounding fringe reefs continue to grow upwards. Rangiroa is a ring of 240 small islands, 80 kilometers long and up to 32 kilometers wide. The team is heading to a particular place, Le Fai, or the break. The reef has literally broken into fragments here, and the resulting underwater landscape of caves and canyons has given rise to a new ecosystem. The origin of this deep crack in the reef is still unclear. And here it looks uh, like you have the reef and then you have a sheer drop, so we'll have a big wall and huh? we'll see what kind of uh, sea life we find. Maybe we'll find some pelagic fish coming in to hunt, but uh, probably not this time of day, but you never know. So it's always interesting. Free divers are always quick to prepare for their dives. Le Fai lies right in front of the Blue Lagoon, a protected area that is home to a myriad of bird species. The reef here is incredibly shallow, and Fred hovers at the water's surface to take in its natural beauty and sheer diversity of animals.
and holding their breaths for around three minutes at a time has taken its toll. Time for a well-earned rest. But as the day nears its end, it's only the beginning for a very special event on Rangiroa. The traditional Rangiroa dance competition. Over 20 different dance groups have gathered to compete against each other. The winner will take part in the final in Tahiti. This spectacle is far from just a tourist experience. Dancing is a big part of life here, and everyone takes part, women, men, and children. It's time for the team to move on. Fakarava is an even better place to study the coral reef ecosystem. French Polynesia's second largest atoll is a UNESCO biosphere reserve. Its six islands host a particularly rich and impressive collection of plants and animals, including some very rare species. This reserve isn't just designed to protect nature. For the people of these flat atolls, it's supposed to facilitate a lifestyle in harmony with nature. That also provides a secure resource base for the future of the islanders. One of the main sources of income here is the export of one of the legendary symbols of the South Pacific, the black Tahiti pearl. Fred meets up with Maitata, one of the divers working on the pearl farm of Fakarava. Water quality, the composition of the seafloor, and local currents are all decisive factors for the growth of giant black-lipped oysters, the only oysters to produce Polynesian black pearls. They live off microscopic sea creatures, collectively called plankton, and plant components found in the lagoons. Today, pearl farms have taken the place of the traditional Polynesian pearl industry putting an end to the destructive over-exploitation of wild pearl oysters by divers. Towards the end of the 19th century, people realized that this precious species was under threat. Over-harvesting spelled disaster for the naturally slow-growing oyster beds. Pollution from agricultural fertilizers and raw sewage added to the problems. The oysters could only be saved by putting strict controls on their collection. The value of individual pearls range from $100 for a small pearl of average quality to $10,000 for a perfectly round pearl with a diameter of 19 millimeters. You can see the pearl. I'll pick it up. It's rainbow colors are created by the different layers of the pearl, which serve as a kind of prism and break the light, just like raindrops do. Can you give me a tip where to dive around here? Yes, at the South Pass. The South Pass is smaller than the North Pass. That's where you find more sharks. And when you find more sharks, there are also more fish, since people don't tend to fish the waters with many sharks. That's why you'll always find a lot of fish where there are lots of sharks. And that's why I think you should go to the South Pass. My Tata told us the best place to dive. If we want to get to the South Pass, we'll have to traverse the lagoon. 
That will take two hours by boat. Fakarava is the second biggest lagoon in Polynesia. The distance to Tetamanu is 65 kilometers. We can dive there for a few days. The team decide to take their chance with Maitata's tip-off and soon get on the way. Dawn on the reef. It is five in the morning. First light bathes the shore. The team is ready for their first outing. But the weather isn't exactly as one might imagine the South Pacific. Despite this, the divers try to stay optimistic. No, it'll be interesting. I've never done it. So I'm curious to see what's here. I hear there's a big uh, school of gray reef sharks, uh, three or 400 of them. So I'm excited to see that. But... You never know if, uh, if they're going to be here today, or uh, you never know what you're going to see. So that's always the exciting part about the first time diving any spot. So we'll see what happens. A challenge.
for a well-earned break for the divers. Free diving is exhausting, and they have to be careful to conserve their energy for the other dives planned later that day. There's fresh hope that the weather might clear up in time for their dive at midday. Midday. Temperatures have risen to their daily maximum, and it's not just land animals that are having a rest. Below water, the pace of life is also changing. The sun is of the utmost importance for the reef. As the corals grow, they need light to accomplish this feat of engineering. Reefs are essentially like metropolises of the sea. Their builders and architects are tiny coral polyps that live off plankton floating in the water. But they tend to live in nutrient-poor waters and have recruited the help of tiny algae to survive. These microscopic plants have colonized their tissues and by turning sunlight into sugars, supply about 90% of the coral polyp's nutrient requirements. That's why the reefs grow towards the sun. They can only live in shallow waters, full of light. The algae also give them their vibrant coloration. Around two million single-celled algae crowd every square centimeter of coral stem. The industrious coral polyps and their algae provide a haven for thousands of other species. Coral reefs are home to a staggering 25% of all marine life and form nurseries for many oceanic fish. But this fruitful arrangement comes at a price. The algae cannot thrive in waters that are too warm or too cold. Many fish are now having a rest. They congregate in dense shoals at the reef, trying to protect themselves from attackers. The sheer diversity of shapes and colors found among the creatures of this coral reef is breathtaking.
4 o'clock in the afternoon. Clouds begin to darken the sky once again. It's never easy to film animals. We have to pay attention to a lot of things. The weather, the animals. But there are a lot of things we can't plan ahead, including if there'll be any animals, if this is their season. The weather is always important. At the moment, there's a tropical storm. It's been raining for three days now, and the wind is really strong. It's raining around the atoll and the lagoon, and the rainwater's draining into the lagoon, which means the visibility in the water is not good. All of these factors combined make our work very difficult. But today, luck is on their side. The weather improves again, and the team can start another dive. They want to check out a number of locations in the reef channel to see which animals are active here. A detailed briefing before every dive is extremely important. The divers have to take note of the currents, which shift their direction and strength throughout the day. A strong current also saps a lot of energy, which in turn means higher oxygen consumption. For free divers, this is especially important, since it can seriously compromise their safety. Free divers can quickly get into the water without much preparation, check out the situation, and return to the boat they should be able to get a good all-round impression of life in the channel. At dusk, Fred wants to observe the reef sharks. The channel is extremely busy. These green chromies are on their way to spawn en masse. Gray reef sharks rest and sleep in a large shoal. They're waiting for nightfall to patrol the reef in search of prey once again. Until then, they rest, suspended by the current in the channel. Sharks don't have swim bladders, so without actively swimming, they sink. But the water currents in the channel help suspend them without much effort on their part. Another dive, and the team come across white tip reef sharks. Fred and Will are able to approach them without spooking the animals in the slightest. These sharks are very different, able to lie on the channel bed to rest because they can actively pump water through their gills to breathe. Other types of shark have to keep swimming to get enough water through their gills. Then one of the largest animals in the ocean makes an appearance. Manta rays can grow to have a wingspan of over seven meters. This gentle giant is now in full feeding mode. Despite their size, they feed on some of the smallest animals in the sea. In the twilight of the fading day, many larvae drift in from the open sea to get into the lagoon. Ideal feeding conditions for the manta rays which can each filter as much as 140 kilos of plankton from the water every single day. Fred and Will return to the boat to wait for the sun to set. That's when some types of surgeon fish begin to spawn. The divers take a look around the exit of the reef channel. The noise generated by the reef creatures is constant and accompanies the divers on their excursions. With the changing light conditions on the reef, a different set of fish emerge from their daytime hideouts. These white-spotted surgeon fish have come here from the upper part of the reef to spawn. This is where Fred is waiting calmly 
and noiselessly. A spawning frenzy ensues. The females swim upwards and expel a cloud of eggs. The males follow quickly to fertilize them. In the twilight, white-cheeked surgeon fish show off their elaborate mating dance. Filefish, too, have gathered to spawn. The last light slowly fades away. Night approaches, and with it, the time of the hunters. There is a changing of the guards at the reef. The fish shoals that gathered to rest and seek protection from daytime hunters are now ready to turn stalkers themselves. Time for day active animals to seek suitable hideouts. If you want to survive the night, it pays to find a way of making yourself invisible to the night stalkers. The divers prepare for their last dive of the day, an expedition right into the heart of the nighttime reef of Fakarava. Christian Petron explains some of the extraordinary ways fish try to outwit their nemeses. Certain types of fish, like the parrotfish, for example, protect themselves at night with a cocoon. It's a transparent layer of mucus that hides the scent from predators. There are a lot of sharks here, and with their sense of smell, the white-tip reef sharks spend their nights looking for sleeping fish. So the parrotfish is using this mucus cocoon to stop hunters being able to smell it. The change from twilight to nighttime happens quickly in the tropics. This is really interesting because now we see animals that spend their day sleeping. When they're sleeping, we can take nice pictures and film them easily because they don't flee. But at night, you can see mussels and big crustaceans. For example, there are a lot of reef crabs, like these big red crabs here. These are animals you only get to see at night. It's not frightening to dive at night, because we know what we're doing and we know the area. At the beginning, it can be a little unsettling to come here and see the great whites. <laughs> Wait, hang on a second. Don't forget your light. I won't. Underwater, visibility is now extremely limited, and the divers have to use lights to find their way. The first night hunter the divers come across is a moray eel. Soldier fish rise from their caves up to the surface. This is where they feed. Sleeping fish now have to worry about nurse sharks, and the seemingly placid groupers show their true colors. The divers search the floor of the channel for caves in which parrotfish might have found sanctuary.
they do well to withdraw deep into the caves to avoid becoming somebody else's dinner. This parrotfish is sleeping deeply, its protective mucus cocoon clearly visible. But will it be enough to shield it from the thorough attentions of this nurse shark? This predator seems intent not to leave any stone unturned in its search for prey. Once again, the free divers are able to approach and observe both the hunters and the hunted without spooking the animals. The behavior they witness is natural and not flawed by outside influences. Sun corals live in these caves. Unlike the reef-building corals, they don't host algae and work as stationary predators, using their long tentacles to catch plankton. But their nighttime feast means taking risks. Sea slugs are out looking for them. On the reef, the hunter can quickly become the hunted. It's time for the divers to finish their expedition. It's been an exhausting day, spending 24 hours with the inhabitants of the coral reef. The sheer diversity and density of life on these reefs throughout the different stages of a single day has been overwhelming. In places like Fakaraba, it becomes clear just how important it is for humanity to conserve these last few Edens left on Earth. The first reason why I'm freediving is, of course, because I love that and I enjoy being in the ocean. I think, uh, for me, it's the best way of, uh, of life, and I really enjoy that. But the second reason also, uh, and that's mainly why I'm working with scientists and I'm trying to, uh, to spread the information, is somehow to uh, contribute to uh, help for the protection of the ocean, of course. Um, even though I think... Uh, it's getting urgent to do something, if not too late. Um, I think it's important to contribute. That's my contribution. I'm doing it really for the, the protection of the, the animals first, uh, for their right to exist there, just to be there as animals like they've been for uh, uh, millions and millions of years. I'm there to, uh, to help the animals to be themselves. 